Cheering at pro wrestling shows in Japan is back, and 2023 is already shaping up to be a big year in the history of pro res. That's why you should listen to the Emerald Flow Show. From the Royal Road to the Green Mat, Paul and Gerard take you into the world of All Japan Pro Wrestling and Pro Wrestling Noah. Not only do we analyze events, but we examine business, who is getting over, what angles are working, or not. Occasionally, we take a look at other Japanese promotions like DDT and Zero One. So if you're looking for more coverage of the world of Japanese wrestling, check out the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, available on all of your favorite podcast apps. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, To open the voice gate for March 19th, 2024. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast feed or on our dedicated Open the Voice Gate feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, take, uh, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says sponsor this podcast and you set up a one time a reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I am one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears, joined alongside, as always, K Slow in this special rewind and rewatch edition celebrating Dragon Gate 25. What we're going to do this episode, we didn't really even mention it in the show title, but Case. We're going to talk a little bit about Rey de Parejas, uh, Dragon Gate 2024, before we're going to completely hand the wheel over to you and, as we get into this month's Rewind and Rewatch episode. But Case, first off, how are you doing today, bud? I'm okay. I, I'm okay. Weather's warm in Chicago. Uh, you know, a little March Madness action. Uh, the uh, the play-in games, round of 68 coming to 64. MLB The Show came out today. Fire that up for a little bit. I, I'm doing okay, Mike. How are you? You know, I saw MLB The Show popped up on Game Pass. That's kind of how I do about 95% of my game playing is if it's something on Microsoft Game Pass. And I'm having like that little bit of an inch in the back of my head. Like I really don't have the time right now planning a wedding, planning like renovation and all the stuff like this. But is this time for me to like boot up MLB The Show and see if I can get uh, Mike Spears, uh, third baseman to the majors for the Rangers this year? I think so. I think so. And look, I don't have time in my life either. I'm, I basically forced it into a busy afternoon, but I was like, I'm going to play five innings. Just I want to I want to see what the White Sox roster looks like, uh, which not good, by the way. I, I mean, shockingly bad is actually how the White Sox roster looks. Uh, you know, with the show like NBA 2K, it's a yearly day one purchase. I think it's a, a marvelous game. And I think the last two years, they've actually made it much, much better than it had been. Madden. It depends on the year. I'm I bought Madden this year and I was not satisfied with it. I, I played it maybe for two weeks and then it was just like, all right, well, I, guess, I guess that's it. I still don't like the quarterback system, so I'm just going to be done with this. It will be the show. I normally do every other year, so I didn't play last year's, but I played a lot of it'll be the show 22 and. I That's will I, I will say MLB The Show 24 feels like a different game. You know, it feels updated. It feels sleek. It feels very smooth through through, a, you know, basically half a game. I think I played five innings as the White Sox. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to playing more this week. Yeah, it's something that for me, I feel like that two year cycle is the right mindset, considering like 2022. That was the first real game of the current generation of systems yeah. in a way. So, like, I, you now have been through it enough to experience what I've done 
my entire life. Like whenever they do these generation changes, they take a massive a massive step back for the first two or three years, especially on these periodic sports games. But it's really like year three and year four where they're really kind of kicking in all cylinders. And I feel like that is the other reason why the show seems kind of appealing to me in that way. My thing is, and I'm trying to decide like if I'm at this point in my life where I have a certain place for a certain game, a uh, certain sports game that will be coming back this summer. Oh, the college football game. Yeah, I have to decide whether or not that, because I think, and it's something where for me, and I've talked to uh, Craig about this a lot, like we are of this generation that NCAA college football was kind of the nerds game because it was the college game that they really gave the service to. And you're able to do certain things with that. And it went away after the, uh, Macklemore, uh, not Macklemore. I'm blanking on the UCLA, uh, lawsuits name, but it went away for like a decade. And now it's coming back. I just have to decide whether or not I'm about that life anymore with it. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. I mean, the, the danger is that it's an EA football game. So I might right. be incredibly unsatisfied with it, but, and I don't play Madden. So, like, what am I getting myself into as essentially a boomer getting into, like, a modern college football game when I haven't played, like, EA or anything in about 10, 15 years? Or I, I, think, I, I think you should just because I think you'd be shocked at how things handle now. Like, I'm always curious about kids that are maybe, like, super into basketball. I guess there's probably ways you can modify it to do it, but, like, 2K is not a pick-up-and-play experience. Like, it's a really in-depth and intricate game and i like it that way i would rather it be like that but you know it's i i, I think there's a, a leap that you'd be surprised by i think with the show and with college football my my hot video game take i never played uh mlb mvp baseball 2005 whatever the one with manny ramirez on the cover is the like greatest baseball game ever but allegedly allegedly do you have a different take I mean, I am of an age that I'm going to sound like I'm I'm just insane about saying this, but I really like the NES bases loaded game. I think yeah. it's for what it is for the arcade and a little bit of depth for the NES. I feel like that's the best baseball game ever played, made. OK, can't speak to that because just before my time, but the the EA Sports baseball game was always super highly rated. I never played the MLB version of it, but MVP base, uh, college baseball, college baseball, yeah, MVP college baseball, 2007, one of the greatest video games of all time. I miss it to this day. I, I really should get a PS2 and get a copy of that game and just play it. Actually, by, you'll appreciate this as a child, my team on that game, university of Miami hurricanes. Oh, you have to be. I mean, the team that made college baseball, what it was. I yeah, mean, no, it's I, I look, I mean, I'm a college baseball fan to begin with. And we're, we're kind of at that time where you start seeing it, you know, pop up more and more on ESPNU, which I'm excited about. But I, if they, if they would resurrect that game, I think me and 10 other people would play it. But I would be so excited about that. I, I feel like we would probably start like a college dynasty. Like, but, but like the two of us, we could probably get uh, Samsa aboard on this. I feel yes, like we can get yeah, him that, into that, it. You're right. That's right for the picking for Chris Samsa who's yeah. about to have a baby and, and definitely can pick up a college baseball video game with the time <laughs> he has now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we're really doing are the people with the least amount of time possible, and this is what we're doing for our time instead of wrestling <laughs> coverage. It, it, you know what it is? So right, real quick, we'll talk Dragon Gate in a second. So my video game time is Friday afternoon. That I, I come home from work around noon. I leave to go to my girlfriend's place for the weekend around 4 noon to four friday afternoon is purely video game time that's when i get to play it i don't have time saturday i don't have time sunday i don't have time largely monday through thursday i get a few hours friday afternoon and it's my favorite thing of the week i look forward to it and this friday we are pivoting from nba 2k back to mlb the show I feel like then you got to get. Do you do Road to the Show, or are you past that and you're doing Diamond Dynasty? At this I, no, point? I, I'm I'm still a franchise guy. I you know okay. like especially especially NBA 2K. I go really deep on the franchise mode. I really like the way 2K uh, handles on MLB the Show. I'll play around with Road to the Show. I don't get super into it, but I just I want to play franchise mode. And then on the show, they added a few years ago the March to October, which is like a. Uh, a sped up season mode where they give you a lot of scenarios throughout the season, but it's kind of one of those like, Oh, you could do a March to October in an afternoon if you really wanted to. 
and feel the drama of a season, the highs and lows, et cetera. But I, I, I just keep it franchise mode and that's just what I prefer. I, I respect that. I mean, there's a certain kind of old school cred about just doing franchise, not bothering if your own makeup player. Cause I'm the idiot that makes the, uh, the uh, third baseman for the uh, Texas Rangers every single time. And then I play like two weeks worth of games. And I'm like, you know what? I just got through the first season. I'm done for five yeah, it's like, oh, I, like I don't want to climb through double A. Like, oh, God, right. this is just going to take so long. It, 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 and in a lot of ways, what, I f- what it must feel like to be the minor league player at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to Frisco. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, good. I'm in Charlotte now. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Just got this. Ele- I just got promoted. That's fantastic. <laughs> that, that, that's what I need. That, 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 that's what I need looking at the player. And then you're going like, what is this? Uh, uh, just icon of myself. It's like, well, if I was like 25 and, you know, a foot taller and, and all this, it's like, no, well, what am I doing here? Yeah. What am I yeah, doing exactly. here? I will, I will, why am I doing this? Why am I not talking about Ray de Parejas week two? So let's talk about that case. Uh, Ray de Parejas, we had three shows this last week. We're going to go pretty quickly through this as the meat of the show is going to be rewind and rewatch. Uh, 16th, 17th, 18th. Uh, we have them all on YouTube here. We're kind of getting into the deep pickings of the tournament. Next week, they are going to pretty much close out block play as they uh, continue onwards. But looking back in Okayama, Hiroshima, and Totori case, uh, what were your real takeaways a- after week two of uh, Ray de Prey House 2024? I think as we begin to prepare to exit the first quarter of the year, we have to look at Kamei and Jason Lee as a legitimate tag team of the year contender until otherwise noted. You know, it'll be very interesting to see just given the the storylines going on in Drangay right now, whether or not these guys team with each other after April or after May, or if they're even teaming with one another in the second half of the year. But the, the takeaway for me is they have the Drangate match of the year that they had in Cork and Hall. And then they have this just sublime match against uh, Susumu and Yamato, and then on on March 18th, you have the Natural Vibes Explodes match, where it's those guys against KZ and UT, and I, I have all of those matches, obviously, uh, notebook status to say the least. I am really impressed with what they're doing as a team. Yeah, and it's something where after the first week, the story was Natural Vibes kind of t- coming apart at its seams in that first week. What's going to happen when you have KZ and UT, the uh, the team that was not the most decorated uh, team within Natural Vibes, but I mean, they were a tag team champions in Ryukyu dragging. Going up against what I would say is the uh, number one seed out of Natural Vibes and former Twin Gate champions, Kung Fu Masters. And the way that this match finished up with a huge Jason misfire into JFK, into a UT Hikari no Wa to get the win here. Big pull apart between JFK and Jason in the post match. They finally get back together at the end. But you have the, the these performances now, and you have a this kind of role that UT has both of the natural vibes wins out of that team. But now instantly you look at this where we're entering the second week uh, or this uh, third week of play, and natural vibes teams are now sitting at a essentially four points and three points in that block and almost out of it at this point. Yeah. Yamato and Susumu have a, a very big lead over everybody. As I quickly crunch some numbers here, they've already uh, clinched their knockout spot after this. So they're going to the semifinals at the very least. Yeah. uh, I'll run through the uh, boxes at this point. So, and the A block, it's basically the stories of you either have four points or you have zero points right now. In the A block, it's uh, Team Muscle at zero at 0 and 3. It's uh, Big Boss Shimizu and Strong Machine J at 2 and 1 and 4 points. It is uh, No Hug, uh, Naruki Doi, and uh, Dragon Kid at 2 and 1 and 4 points as well. However, they have the tie break over uh, Big Machine. Zero points for uh, Aganiso, but they have only had one match, and that was a uh, a double DQ. Or no, that was a no contest there. Kai yeah, double and, count out. Yeah, Ka- Kai and Johnny Valletta, they are at 2 0 0 and 2. Two wins and two double count outs, four points. And then uh, the Ryuku Dragon team are at zero points. That's the A block. So you really already have essentially 
it's going to be real hard unless you are Agoniso to advance out of the A block if you're at zero points. But kind of almost like this real chaotic thing that if uh, Kai and uh, Johnny get past or keep the match in the ring against a big machine, they probably win this block. Yeah, which I, I, I thought was a threat. You know, I said when we previewed this tournament, I think there's no chance Kai and Valletta win the, the tournament, but I also think there's a very strong chance they get to the semifinals. But the thing that's unfolded as we've gone throughout is I, I'm just having a very hard time imagining the way this tournament has played out thus far. I'm having a very hard time imagining natural vibes in both blocks not being involved in the semifinals at the very least. And I, I think it should be Big Machine against uh, you know either KZ and UT or, or Jason and Jackie in the finals of the tournament. And I think if you're going to have vibes really start to implode, they should do it with the highest stakes imaginable. But it's, it's very interesting. You know, the A block has been decimated uh, intentionally by Kai and Valletta. And I like the way they're handling their matches. Of course, you've got no hug uh, doing really strong work there as well. And natural vibes doing really strong work there as well. And the B block, uh, the Yamato and Susumu all-star team, I think has lived up to, uh, every bit of hype that we had coming in. We are not getting off night Yamato. We are not getting 2022. Uh, hey, why don't we phase me out, Susumu? These guys are working hard and they are working well. Yeah, so looking at the B block, uh, Yamato and Susumu are at 3-1-0. and They have yet to drop a uh, loss. They're the only undefeated team in the tournament, but they're at seven points. And basically there's no way that there's no combination that can happen over the next few weeks that can make uh, Yamato and Susumu fell, fall out of the playoffs. So they have already advanced on. Uh, second place right now is that KZ and UT team, uh, two and two right now. Then you have two teams at three. That's Madoka, Kakuda, and uh, Dragon Daya of, uh, Na- of D-Courage, and then Big Hug at three points. Uh, Kung Fu Masters now at one and two. Uh, with two points looking at uh they have matches left against d courage and shun and kai who really are at the back of the block they're at oh two and one only a time limit draw they have against d courage there but they really have a position to be a big spoiler for jackie funky kame and jason lee right now as that's a must win match for kung fu masters coming up on the 30th yeah, and I'm looking forward to that because that's the match in Kobe, if I remember correctly. So yes. you you would you would assume, I I don't know, I I I could be wrong. It's Strangy booking, and sometimes they throw us a, a much anticipated curveball. But you would think Zebrats win that just to establish Skywalker and and Ishin as having guys with more points, not being last in the block. And then you know I I think in the same way that we were surprised by the run that Susumu and Kanda went on last year. I think KZ UT is kind of that perfect team this year. And I mean, you, you would be able to, to know this better than me, but outside of some multi-man matches, and we're talking not six mans, but eight mans and 10 mans and, and multi-man matches and maybe some unit disbands. I mean, if KZ and UT went to the finals, which I think they should, I can't, I can't picture UT in the main event of Cork and Hall at any point in his career. It's something where you're really turning the clock back and you're looking at him as that fifth person in a uh, millennial same, I feel like. Because not even like, even in like the Tri Vanguard days at the end, it was not like UT was going to be on that depth chart. They brought Maria in for to take those falls there, right? Like, it's something that for UT, this is a kind of we're getting to see this team return because remember like they were almost year long uh so rio tag team champions so like they had like this long thing that now they're kind of getting that huge uh r- really i look at this like they have their match last their last match is against big hug right now or oh, and i think that it's a situation where you, that they can get through on six and Really, no one else, uh, then if Big Hug loses that match, they're completely out of it. So I think that that we're looking at a scenario where it is those two coming out of the block where I think if you're going to do Natural Vibes Explodes, you have the route to do so. 
But if you're trying to get uh, the biggest match possible for a Noah tag team before getting the belt off them, you might want to get y- Yamato and Susumu to get that match against Kiyomiya. So uh, just to make sure I heard you correctly. So the last match that KZ and UT have is against Big Hug. Yep, that's their only match left in the block. That's right. Well, that feels like it would decide the block. Well, I mean, the the difficulty of that is, so looking at the matches left, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because there's only uh, six, there's seven blocks, there's seven matches in the A block. There are only five matches in the B block. The the B block, you have Big Hug have not still have a match on the 31st against KZ and UT, but they have the last match of the block against uh, D Courage. Gotcha. So that is, and, and the thing that makes it a little bit of uh, okay about that is it's the match that happens after WrestleMania weekend, too. Oh, so, that's right, because they're because they're off for an entire week in Japan. Right, yeah. So uh, essentially what we have left are, with the, the teams remaining in the matches left, we have two matches left for Team Muscle. They have a match against Aganiso and Ryukyu Dragon Team, which is just taking up space taking up space in this in this tournament uh big machine have johnny and kai and agani so uh no hug have agani so and ryukyu and then you end up the last one of the of the block would be the agani so versus ryukyu match in the a block to go back to my point just a second ago mike do you know what ut was doing on the uh, uh scandal gate show where the millennials disbanded I think he was on match zero. Dark match. You're correct. Yep. Kness defeats UT in 335. Yeah, because I believe like this was like Kness uh, coming back from an injury and before he uh, did the turn into zombie veterans, right? I think it's after because that okay. was that was early. Oh, that was like dead be, or yeah. alive. Yeah. So I think I think he got hurt there. And then let's see the Jimmy's the Jimmy's match was like two weeks later when he turned. No, so this is still this is still evil veteran, evil zombie Kness. So this is not I so Kness was back at this point. Okay. Kness Kness was back, but still with Mad Blanky. Mm-hmm. Uh I let me let me read you the first three matches on this show. Tell me this is not a potential Mike Spears produce show. Uh Kness versus UT, your opener. Akira Tozawa and Kenichiro Arai versus L. Lindemann and Yosuke Santa Maria and Kotoka versus Casey, your first three matches. I mean, there's a lot there. I feel like you that's, got... that's your last that's your main events. You're 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 loading that show up with those matches. I mean Tozawa Juku returns is my main event. Yes it is. Uh we're going to find out if Yuki Ono can put back on the Metallic Brothers uh single it for that. Yeah. No. But uh, the, I, I mean we're just repeating great ideas. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'll, I'll fund it. I'll fund it. I love it. <laughs> but uh, I, as we kind of like look at this tournament right now, it does. We're still really in this position where they have uh, shows coming up uh, tomorrow, the 20th, the 23rd, and the 24th. It really kind of feels like we have to wait until this uh, last week of March and then the that one last match on the 7th before we're really able to make heads or tails out of the scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm really, I'm rooting for the natural vibe scenario here. You know, I, I obviously you've got Yamato and Susumu who have clinched. I think the a block, I think you got to go no hug uh, Dragon kid and, and Nuruki Doi is one of the teams, but I, I am still holding out hope that some way the math shakes out and we get vibes versus vibes at some point. Yeah. I feel like uh, if you give me a minute, I might be able to figure out a way to make it that you have uh Susumu and Yamato coming out block. Uh, let's just say that they go clean sweep. They get here. We nine go. We got, we got Meltzer audio coming up here. Mike's right. gonna do okay. math on the air. Ah, uh, Christ. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I think if we have Yamato and Susumu as B one, we can get to KZ UT as B two. But can we get to Big Machine A one so we get that match where they both explode and we could still have No Hug being be being a two so then we get yamato and susumu versus dragon kid 
and doi oh my as, god i got, I got nauseous I, I i'm trying so hard to follow i might throw up <laughs> I, I i'm just propo- proposing that we could do natural vibes natural vibes in the semifinals, and we could still have no hug versus Susumu and yamato as the other semifinal. that'd be awesome i would love that that's my golden scenario here case and i feel like that's r- all kind of worth getting into about this from the youtube so we we did have a bit of ryu fuda on the tutorial show on the yeah YouTube. yeah fuda versus valetta it looked awesome yeah and that that was something where i felt like the tutorial youtube was the best one out of the three from this last week and uh uh, uh okayama was fine i'm just the, the ryukyu dragon team is as worthless as we thought it would be it's funny. I actually had the opposite thought because their their okay. match, and I, I got to pull up that that uh, card real quick just to remind myself the uh, the Okiyama show. Oh, oh that's was, Kai and Johnny versus uh, Mizoku, uh, Tomonaga, and Sherry Joe. That one was worthless. The next night in Hiroshima against uh, Shimizu Big and Machine. Machine J, I was like, oh, you know what? This match this match is not bad. I mean, it's not it's not great, but it's not bad. I, I was one and a half stars on the Kai and Johnny one. And as someone who's a reformed Johnny hater, I felt real bad. Boy, t- tough week for the uh, Johnny Valletta fan base. I don't know if you heard the flagship this week or not, Mike, but uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, t- t- took a bit of a hit. <laughs> I mean, they just uh, it, it, listen, it, it, it's something where eventually they'll see the light. I look, I've never in my decade now of following Japanese wrestling I've never seen so many different promotions have such unhappy fans and outside of maybe the hardcore all Japan contingent. I feel like the English speaking Dragon Gate crowd is maybe the happiest right now. I maybe maybe watch the tag tournament. A lot of good matches, you know. I, yeah, I, I don't uh, know what to do. I'm not telling you, but you know, pretty pretty good stuff. As someone who did a crash watch of the other tournament that's happening right now, okay. So let me tell you, one of the ones I get done with getting through all of the the tournament stuff, and I'm excited and I'm ready to try to hop on my podcast and talk with my friend about future scenarios. The other one, I don't think they understand how heel wrestling works. No, I again. It, it's it's Dragon Gate. It's not hard. Jackie yeah, Funky, it, J- Jackie Funky Kamei is going to have a good match. Shooting Skywalker is going to be a heel. You know, you would hope at some point your takes on Kai evolve. He's basically just doing Magnitude Kishiwana now. So if you like Magnitude, you'd like Kai. It's a very good promotion. I, I I very much enjoy it. I wish the roster was healthy, but the promotion itself is fine. Yeah, I I, I guess like. One of the things that I did notice was like there was a big freak out about Shun over the week. Well, that's partially my fault. Uh, just because uh, somebody somebody shot me a DM and it appeared that Shun was going to be out for the entire tournament. It looks like he just was pulled off of one show, which is good news because uh, a Dragon Gate without Shun is a Dragon Gate I don't know if I would recommend or not. But yeah, th- th- that is not anything that I want a- any part of at this point. No. Like, the, the, the shoot injury that would have been rough that but i feel like how with how everything is and i mean like next week we have coming up we have a case we we do have booyadin this week that's right i i think it's the weakest card of the booyadin return show so far but it still could end up being pretty fun I, yeah it's booyadin at the end of the, at the end of the week i would rather have a booyadin show than not have a booyadin show but I, I i apologize for doing this right on the show doing production meeting here do you want me to run down this card real quick before we move yeah, on to yeah please yeah so this is on the 21st it'll be a, a 6 30 local time start that's 4 30 on the east coast 1 30 on the east uh, in the west we get a class of 2009 tag team uh kz and yohei Versus Dragon Die and Alejandro as the opener. Open the Awari Gate Championship match. Laundry Muda versus Punch Tomonaga. Can Tomonaga bring it back home to us? Can we finally get one of these uh, invaders out of our mix? Uh, match three, Misaki Mochizuki and Yamato. Uh, kind of the Buyaden only. Like the, This is only for uh, Buyaden, these two guys working together. They're going against Kikataro and, and Ryo Kawamura which man. Th- this is the bummer that, that yeah. i wish that wasn't a comedy match yeah i i, I have liked kawamura on these shows yeah and i have too so like i feel like that this is like where is hikaru sato to get in on this like, yes exactly if it, if it was sato and kawamura i you know 
Sato Great. be damned. I'd be like, all right, I can get into that. Yeah, uh, Team Muscle versus Takashi Sugiera and Hajime O'Hara, sadly. And uh, team Mi- Muscle versus Team Canceled. Am I right, Mike? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then... <laughs> yeah. It, it, you sounded like Triple H. <laughs> I, I, I'm a Triple H seeing the New York Post right now. Like, that's my well, response. Well, I'm that. sure Triple H will be watching. He's a big Dragon Dragon's Gate fan. Yeah, and he has to be when you talk about the uh, BN Zero... Uh, Four volume four main event. It is Big Boss Shimizu against kind of the guy who might have taken Naruki Doi's wind out of his sails about being Mister Wrestling anywhere possible. Shuji Shikawa. Yeah, keep a tab on Shuji. I keep on telling people this. I don't. I don't know anything for sure. But if I were a betting man, I'd, I'd say Shuji Shikawa is going to be in Dragon Gate some this year. I, I think he's one of those guys. He's really tight with the Lek boss. It's like Shun and Leona and Ishikawa, and I, you know, I guess maybe Liger. I, there's like a whole motley crew of of Lek guys. Kenzo Suzuki. Kenzo, yeah. yes, and, and and Shuji's one of them. And I just get the feeling there's going to be a Kobe Sambo Hall show, if not a bigger show, where they do Shun versus Shuji. And and look, I, it's not 2015. I'm not exactly a huge Shuji Ishikawa guy. But I, I'll welcome him into this promotion and see what he can do. I think it's uh, I think him and Shimizu is a really interesting match. Yeah, it, it's intriguing. It's something where I think uh, where the guy is in his career, I think Dragon Gate would not make a lot of sense for him full time. However, no, no, no. I, I would I would be disappointed if he landed here full time. Yeah, and then I would have some bigger questions about other stuff happening, but. If he's going to be appearing for these uh, Kobe Sambo shows and these Sponge Produce shows, I think that that's totally fine as long as it's not like we get the uh, typical Shuji Shikawa Invader Champion angle, basically. Yeah, like, I, I don't. don't I, I I see him only being tied into Lex stuff, and I don't even know that for sure. But with with his current freelancer status, I, it's you, just you know something, to, it something to keep an eye on. You know what I bet it is? Be- I bet it is that. Shuji Shikawa versus Shun will be like that random celebrity uh, Kobe Sambo Hall match. This is what I've been saying. That's the August Kobe Sambo Hall yeah. show. I I would have, if I could bet on it, I would have a large wager of money that it's Shun versus Shuji on that show. That's exactly what I think it is. Yeah, versus Hiroshi Tanahashi showing up to the LEC uh, show center. Thing Hell yeah, where, brother. Mr. Hey, President. I mean, Mr. President needs to talk to Mr. Nagamori about running a, a company, it sounds like. <laughs> and and um, no better place to do it than at a opening of a home goods store. Of course, of course. And for those not clear on the August Kobe Samba Hall show, I've been meaning to ask just for a further, like, dumb English guy clarification on it. We're probably due for a J episode here at some point, and I can, he can explain that far better than I can with the information I have currently. Yeah, I think it, it it's something that I know that he has talked about during a Cora Quinn or a larger show before. But we'll, we'll we'll get him on. We'll talk about that. But case that's what we have really this uh, week in modern Dragon Gate. Is it time to rewind and rewatch? It's time to do it, Mike Spears. We are going back to the year two thousand and five. So welcome back to rewind and rewatch this time case uh it is march and for march we go to march 2005 but before we get there uh should we talk a lot about uh nwa titles well we should because the show we're reviewing today we're doing a full show review of the open the brave gate championship tournament from march 13th 2005 which was the show where the first open the brave gate champion was founded uh also uh, that show is not on the Dragon Gate Network, but I have made it available on my YouTube with an unlisted link. It will be in the description to this podcast and on VoicesOfWrestling.com, as well as a bunch of other links to matches we're going to talk about here. But I thought it would be fun in order to understand where the Open the Brave Gate Championship, uh, where the Open the Brave Gate Championship came from, to rewind way back to 1946 and briefly talk about the history of the NWA World Welterweight Championship, which is what inspired the eventual Brave Gate title. How does that sound, Mike? Absolutely. Let's do this. I think this is the farthest back we have gone, technically. And I I hope it's the furthest back that we go. I can't imagine uh, relaying 1930s wrestling to Dragon Gate, but we we won't be here too long. I'll, I'll give you guys a very, very quick 
history of the NWA welterweight title. It is the belt that uh, I'm sure I'm sure you've seen it before. Very good looking belt. Very memorable title plate. Uh, that belt was founded in 1946 and CMLL controlled that championship from 1946 to 1996. Under CMLL's reign, Mysterioso was the last man to hold the title. He won it in December of 1991 and then vacated it in June of 1992 when he jumped to AAA. I was very interested to find out. I reached out to Cubs and I said, hey, man, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing some work on the NWA uh, welterweight title. Can you send me what you think the most famous matches of this title are pre Mysterioso leaving and the belt being vacated and abandoned for a few years? And this is what I find to be so fascinating about Lucha history is you have this title that by that point had existed for almost 50 years. And Mike, there are six NWA World Welterweight Championship matches on YouTube from 1984 to 1991. Oddly enough, the Fuerza Guerrero versus Mysterioso match uh, making tape. You get to see the last title change before that belt was vacated. I'll have all of these links up at voicesofwrestling.com. Uh, real quick, we don't have to spend a lot of time talking Lucha because we're here to talk Dragon Gate. But Mike, did you watch any of these matches? And if you did, did anything jump out to you? I wanted to touch on one thing real quick. I did not get into these matches. I thought I was going to get a chance to, but instead I got really entranced by uh, the Open the Brave Gate show that we'll be talking about. So the fact that you said it was 1984 was the first match you were, that Cubs was able to, to supply? Yes, yeah, 1984, Moko Kota versus America Raka. So to my knowledge, and I'm certain Cubs would be more than willing to get, kind of do a point of clarification about this, Part of that is the overall TV situation in Mexico as it relates to EMLL at that time. That's why. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So like historically, I think it was actually up until that point, there was no TV allowed from Arena Mexico. Like a lot of stuff was was filmed to my knowledge, but it's just things that did not air. So there was not ever any uh, VHS or beta copy of it. So that's why there was was seven. Exactly. And it's just it's mind blowing to me just how much Lucha doesn't exist in any way that we can consume it. It it really it's really unfortunate uh, as somebody that is watching a lot of old Lucha as of late, even if it doesn't all land with me. I really like knowing that footage exists. And and there's just yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Like then not to soapbox uh, preservation and soapbox too much about this. It is something where. I would question the provenance of the footage before 1984 at this point like it it might be a lost archive i feel like oh yeah i mean because yeah i I mean the 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 segunda cada guys have unearthed uh what has some like lucha offshoot stuff right but that is i mean that's you know segunda cada and they're they're very into it and uh that's that's their own thing let me see if i can find more information about that sorry to cut you off there yeah, but it's just something where, like, just because of the conditions, and especially because of the media of which uh, things were being recorded to of that time, you just, like, the, the worst things to happen to videotape, and that's what it would have been recorded to. Like, I can't imagine them uh, taping or filming, rather, that like, the term there. It would be taping, and magnetic tape like needs to have like up until basically vhs which is the only thing like it'll be a cockroach i feel like we've talked about this before vhs as well live us all but you have to be very very uh careful about the conditions that you would have of this so if mll taped this and still has possession of this archive it would have had to have been in like cold storage for decades for it to be of any for it to the for me to guess that it would be able to be preserved it's just like i feel like it's lost yeah the big i the thing i was referring to as i find more info here the big breakthrough in terms of lucha footage was about a year ago a bunch of panama lucha was unearthed and the saguna kata guys reviewed it and it's a lot of uh, 80s lucha stars and then some guys that i'm obviously unfamiliar with but that was you know that was sort of the last big breakthrough that i'm aware of so yeah you don't have anything until 1984 and even then, it's you know two matches from eighty four, one from eighty nine, one from ninety, and then two from ninety one. The two matches from eighty four, uh, Mokokota versus American Rocco, like I said, 
Uh, Coach is a big, and it's funny because because this website's been back up uh, in discussion lately. Coach is a big PWO guy, big brawling luchador. I, I respect it. It doesn't do a ton for me, but the January 27th, 1984 match of Kota and Raka would, did very, very well on the DVD VR 80s Lucha set. Uh, but the match that I enjoyed of the bunch that will be listed in the description is the last one, the Fuerza Guerra versus Mysterioso match. And that is only because Fuerza, and Mike, I think you would agree with this, to me is like the long... Uh, lost luchador that should have been in dragon gate and it's a real shame that he wasn't yeah it's something where fuerza and with with the way that like the families work and all of that i would not be surprised because of him being basically out of the big two for as long as he has like there's enough like like back and forth i would feel like between people that run it knock upon that i know that that there are Dragon Gate guys that when they've gone on excursion have had like some level of training, I believe, with, with the uh, Guerreras, I, in my knowledge. But it's, it's one of those things that like in, in a lot of ways, like when we talk about the overall Lucharest tree, he is someone that spiritually is very close to like what uh, Hamada was thinking. I feel yeah, like. yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, he honestly and it's funny because they actually wrestled each other in a six man when uh, Shun was in Mexico, but he reminds me a lot of Shun. He's a guy who was heavy on shtick. You know, there were definitely Fuerza matches where he wasn't taking things super seriously, but he could be doing shtick one second and then take an insane bump the next, and then all of a sudden, you go from what seems like it's going to be a lighthearted six-man to this super heated, big move, big bump style of match. And for that reason, you know, I of the uh, the luchadors of that era, he is not the guy that hits in the same way that a a Santo hits or that a Negro Casas hits. But Fuerza, for my money, when he hits, is perhaps my favorite late '80s, early '90s uh, luchador. Yeah, and he's someone that I feel like, as like a Rudo, he was really able to be that foil for those guys in the late '80s and early '90s, like Octagon and things like that. There is, let let me, as we're recommending Lucha matches here, let me, let me find this real quick. I won't put this in the description. You'll have to find it yourself, but there's a Fuerza Guerrero match from, God, I think it's 87. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, It's 1986. Negro Casas versus Fuerza uh, from September 20th, 1986 in WWA. So I think this was Los Angeles. That is one of the best 80s lucha matches there is that is negro casas as a very young man doing absolutely insane things and fuerza guerrera again ungodly charisma ungodly amount of risk that is, i'm gonna rewatch that when we're done i love that match <laughs> and, and it's something where i feel like when you like look at this belt like it had like certain things that it would make a lot of sense how it would end up becoming the, uh, to- the the belt that would be so identified with Torima in Japan during its time. Like exactly. It, the, the, there's a, a, a level of like providence that happens, I feel like, with uh, w- with your Fraser Guerrero's and how it kind of evolves into the house belt that it becomes in, uh, in 1999. That is exactly why we're doing this. So in 1995, after a few years of the belt being vacant, the uh, CMLL, they bring it back with a tournament that features Negro Casas uh, defeating El Hijo del Santo in the finals on December 2nd. That was uh, at the time because there would be a very hyped up match. I watched it. It's good. Not great. Uh, they've had much better matches together. But whenever it's Casas and Santo, I think you have to do yourself a favor and watch it. So Santo, I'm sorry, not Santo, but Casas takes that belt to Japan as a part of the J Crown tournament in August of 1996. And we'll just briefly go over this J Crown here. Uh, Otani, Shijiro Otani, he defeats Negro Casas. He acquires that belt alongside the UWA Light Heavyweight Championship belt. The next night, Ultimo Dragon then defeats uh, Shijiro Otani. He wins the UWA and NWA belts to go along with his WAR International Junior Heavyweight Championship and his Michinoku Pro British Commonwealth Junior Heavyweight Championship. And then the night after that, Great Sasuke defeats Ultimo Dragon. Uh, that is the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship, the WWF Light Heavyweight Championship, the WWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship, and the NWA World Junior Heavyweight Championship to go along with the aforementioned belts that I just said that Ultimo Dragon had. 
So the J crown bounced from Sasuke to Ultimo to Liger to El Samurai to Otani with Otani vacating the J crown all because the WWF wanted their light heavyweight championship back. Yeah. And it is kind of funny how it landed with where Ultimo at one time, like there is the photograph where he is technically the WCW cruiserweight champion at the time, having that WWF belt became kind of awkward very quickly. Yeah. I, it's weird because you forget Sasuke was the first guy to win it because the photo of Ultimo is so much more famous. I think it is in a lot of ways, like you have these moments in history where great Sasuke could have been like the guy of the moment. Like if we talk about Lucha Rest, like the person that, in a lot of ways, I feel like gets forgotten in a lot of times is like the key, like these key figures, even though he was the one who splintered from, from Hamada's uh, Universal and made Michinoku Pro, as we talked about a couple episodes ago, was great Sasuke. But in a lot of ways, and it happens more, more often, the more you look into it, Ultimo supersedes him. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I said this to Alan, and I think I said this on the show a few months ago. Sasuke is a weird glaring omission from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame, and it's not that his work is so outstanding. I think Sasuke should be in as a promoter because he was the first guy to promote it with a home base outside of Tokyo. But when you think about his in-ring career, it's like 93 to 96 is his peak, and then you have some stuff in 97. But by the time he comes back to Japan, I'm not saying he hasn't had a good match since, but... His his actual peak as like a super worker is very very short, all things considered. Yeah, I and I think it is situational with him as well that I have to imagine, and I've seen a good bit of like the handhelds of that. That it really is a case where a lot of Sasuke's ba- best work was done with behind the camera, what well, was done away from cameras, and just was not taped because of the amount of touring and such that would have happened in that period for that kind of wrestling. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, again, you think about it like we we give Ultimo basically 1990 to 1998 as his peak, and that, all things considered in modern wrestling, is a pretty short peak. You know, you have guys now that are able to excel for a decade, a decade plus. Think about the original class of Toriyaman and, you know, Susumu and Mochi and Fuji, 25, 30 years for these guys. Ultimo's got eight years. But he surpasses Sasuke, I think, uh, partially just because of the North American coverage that Ultimo got. And so more people are familiar with him, at least that might be listening to this podcast. But also, his run as a peak worker is twice as long as Sasuke's. Yeah, and and I do think that Sasuke, you have the thing where maybe if Sasuke was not Sasuke, he actually gets that WWF run. Like It it is something where like when we talk about the peak, when we talk about exposure— in a lot of ways, it is Ultimo superseding him, but it's not like Sasuke did not have his hand hand in his undoing in that method. No, very much so. That's actually a fascinating, uh, fascinating time in history. I, I need to go back and read some observers from that point. But anyways, uh, the NWA World Welter World Welterweight Championship it was tied into the J Crown. J Crown was vacated. That belt stayed in Japan. And when Ultimo Dragon founded Toriyaman in 1999, when it landed in Japan, we talked about that in January. Go back and listen to that episode if you missed it. He needed a title. And so on that first tour, February 6th, 1999, Dragon Kid defeated Dr. Cerebro to win the NWA World Welterweight Championship. And then Dragon Kid would go on to defend the belt against Sua before losing it to Sua in April of 1999. And Mike, I would assume it's the same for you. I associate this title largely with Sua uh, when I think about uh, Toriyaman and the NWA World Welterweight Championship. It, it's something where I feel like, especially in those early years, and he always kind of figured his way back kind of in that picture. It, it, it's one of the fascinating things about Toriyaman was there was not really a Toriyaman like main singles title belt for years. And it is something where like you would have different belts supersede that. And at least initially, like you have this few Dragon Kid and Sua, which becomes kind of this long overarching feud that starts around the belt, but then gets far beyond that. And you kind of tie it into this for me. And this is going to be the most me 
uh, kind of explanation possible. You know who I identify with the with the world welterweight title in the uh, Toriman Japan days? Who's that? It's Kenichiro Rai to me. Okay, well that makes sense because Arkin is the one who defeats Sua for the belt. Sua has the belt for over an year. Uh, over a year, wins it April of ninety nine, loses it July of two thousand. That clears the way for the hair versus uh, hair match or hair versus mask match rather between Dragon Kid and Sua in August of that year. Now Dragon Kid can go over, but he doesn't have to win that belt. Instead, Arakin wins it in July of 2000. He defends the belt against Genki Horiguchi and Yasushi Kanda and then loses it to Susumu Mochizuki in December. Susumu wins the belt from Arakin, like I said, but then is forced to vacate the title he won due to excessive outside interference, which at the start of 2001 then leads to a tournament where we go in a circle here and Arakin wins the belt again uh, after defeating Yasushi Kanda in the finals of the welterweight tournament. Yeah, and it's kind of at this point where 2001, we if if we wanted to kind of splice our our most recent episodes of Rewind and Rewatch, we're talking at this point really when M2K was getting its wheels underneath them in early 2001. So Kanda's in the picture there, but it goes quickly over just around Arakan and, and M2K, it feels like, for the next few years. Exactly, exactly. So January of 2001, Arakan has the belt. January of 2001, if you remember from the M2K episode, is when Masaki Mochizuki goes to Michinoku Pro and wins the Michinoku Pro British Commonwealth Junior Heavyweight Championship. So Arkin has the welterweight belt. Mochi has the Michinoku Pro belt. In May, Susumu wins the welter be- welterweight belt from Arkin and then defends it successfully against Ricky Marvin and Dragon Kid. And then in July, at Kobe World that year, Mochi loses the British Commonwealth title to Magnum Tokyo. And that is when we see the welterweight belt not officially because there was never an announcement made, but if you're watching the promotion around the time, you see the welterweight belt go from the top prize being held by a Sua or a Dragon Kid to a definitive shift to the mid card, what we would now recognize as the Brave Gate belt. That starts in July of 2001. And then if you're looking at what's the top belt in Torimon, Japan, I would say basically up through uh, Suji winning in 03 and they introduced the udg belt so you essentially from here you get kind of the transition over to the michinoku pro british commonwealth belt becoming the main one for the next essentially i would say 24 months case yeah about a year and a half because i think the ultimo belt comes in at el numero uno 2003 maybe oh 2004 2004 wow okay yeah so yeah it, it, it it's something where you also have a situation in 2003. So there's a time where June is British Commonwealth champion. He is technically the last one that happened. Yeah, that's an eyesore statistically, right? That just doesn't look right in the title lineage. Right. It's just absolutely wild. But at this time, then with the welterweight belt, which if you like look at how these belts really were designed, at least when uh, EMLL and later SumoLL promoted it, welterweight really was kind of this like, weight class that i feel like as soon as it kind of was redefined as that for dragon gate it felt kind of like the lineage of this previous belt in a lot of ways yeah i completely agree and it's you know one of those things that i think we've seen in dragon gate during particularly interesting periods you think about this time in 2001 2002 early parts of 2003 when torimon was really hot and then you think about 2019 and pre-pandemic 2020, where, you know, the talking point between people like you and me and Alan Forel was like, hey, look at Dragon Gate's rookies. They're, they're not wrestling like Hulk or like Shingo or like Tozawa. They're kind of doing this bantamweight, welterweight, strike heavy, but super fast style of matches. And uh, I think that's a direct lineage of what we saw here in the early 2000s. Oh, absolutely so. And it's something where I feel like when we talk about the, the shift and the belts in the way like it kind of it, it it kind of returns and it kind of fluctuates in that way and i find that's kind of like a little bit of the magical part of the nwa welterweight belt and really is someone who i feel like is interesting about it and someone who i always really identify with it especially in this time frame we're about to get to is ricky marvin and in his time in torimon that's exactly right so you see in september rio saito he defeats asuma mochizuki for the belt 
He defends it against Genki. He defends it against Ricky Marvin. And then he loses the belt to Genki, who goes on to have a decent little reign, but he is forced to vacate the title after a no contest due to Dragon Kid. Who wins the NWA World Welterweight Championship in Torimon? None other than Ricky Marvin. He beats Supernova for the welterweight belt at World 2002. I have to say, I have zero recollection of this. Yeah, I don't either. It took me a moment to go like, oh yeah, that was the match in O2. Yeah. <laughs> because, and, and I feel like it's also a situation that happens that O2 Kobe World, you also have the fact that you have the T2P and Torimon uh, Japan feud really uh, exploding at Absolute Mente a month later. Yeah, yeah. And, and Marvin had some cachet with this title previously because one of the early famous Susumu matches, I think it's June of 2001, it's Susumu versus Ricky Marvin. And it's uh, outside of the work that he did in Noah, it might be the best Ricky Marvin match ever. And, you know, it's not the, not the highest bar, but it's a, it's a damn good match between those two. So Ricky Marvin wins the belt. Genki wins it back from him. Darkness Dragon then becomes your NWA World Welterweight Championship. And then Masada Yoshino at the time, all caps Yoshino, he wins the belt March 22nd, 2003. And Mike, he would never lose this title. He would hold it for a year plus, and he would be the champion when Toriumon split into Dragon Gate in the summer of 2004. Yes. So uh, this is a time where I would like us to refer, or the listeners, if you're interested, especially in Yoshino's time with the belt and how it went from him and Darkness Dragon. I refer you all to a episode we did talking about the Darkness Dragon and Yoshino feud in 2022 before uh, Kness's retirement. So this was one of the one of those really foundational feuds that at least when you're talking about late Toriyaman and hinging into Dragon Gate, and as you would see in the formation of the Open the Brave Gate title, this was the NWA World Welterweight feud in recent memory going into Dragon Gate. This was where the belt felt like it was around. It, it had the, the matches where you had the big phrase of hot fighting and the tentacle and the counter wrestling really come into its forefront in this feud. And that kind of was the last color of the welterweight title and, and its existence in Torimon, Japan. Yeah, so that is a very good way of putting that. So that is the history of the NWA World Welterweight Championship from beginning through 2004, the split from Torimon to Dragon Gate. That belt is abandoned uh, in the middle of 2004. We won't cover the history beyond that point, but now we can sort of shift gears if everybody follows along into simply the Dragon Gate timeline and I'm going to highlight a few things that get us to March of 2005, because uh, Mike, in December of 2004, Naruki Doi says, I'm sick of being a jobber. I'm sick of being a character. In 2005, I'm going to return to my real name. I'm going to wrestle as Naruki Doi. And then he ends the year with two notable matches. They do some fan appreciation shows on Christmas Day and then on December 26th. Christmas Day, there's a match. It's final M2K. So it's Kness, Arakin, Mochi, Susumu, and Second Doi, still wrestling a Second Doi, they defeated Mori Milano and Yoshino of the Italian Connection, and then the Florida Brothers, Daniel Mishima and Michael Owasa, in a one-night tag team tournament. And then after the match, Doi, feeling good about himself, challenged Yoshino to a singles match. So the next night, December 26, 2004, we get the first ever Doi versus Yoshino singles match, and all caps Yoshino defeats Second Doi in 13 minutes here. Uh, Mike, you, you're uh, uh, intimately familiar with this man's career. 2003, 2004, Naruki Doi wrestling at second Doi at the time. Not exactly someone we thought would eventually be a two-time Dreamgate champion. Yeah, it is at this point where I think that we, we have talked a little bit about second Doi, and it's one of those things where now, and tw uh, with 2024 eyes, we look back fondly, and whenever we have Tori Mon reunion, when he brings out the jersey and we try to find out what the starting lineup is we're like oh this is like his uh immature gimmick in the same way that we were about uh Yo all caps yosino in that way but it was a very difficult uh start of naruki doi's career uh 
he was a original member of the T2P class and was going to be a focal point of T2P, but knee injuries never let him get out of the gate into such a point where he was kind of swept into Final M2K. And Final M2K always kind of had this position where they have a young guy in the unit who really should be doing something better with himself. And second, Doi was the first one to really inhabit that role. I think that's a very good analysis of Final M2K. <laughs> because it's him. It's, uh, it is uh, Battleship Yamato. Yeah. Uh, they offer it to Akira Tozawa, uh, Kazuhika Nakajima. It is a kind of cursed position, just like being the fifth member of Crazy Mac. Although Nakajima was awesome. Oh, I mean, that was because he was a supernova. Yeah, he. I, if you've never seen Dragon Gate era Katsuhiko Nakajima... Oh, my God. What, what, what a guy. Uh, it's just such a shame he didn't land here full time. But nevertheless, uh, the end of 2004, like I said, you start to see uh, this idea that, OK, something is happening with second Doi, now Naruki Doi. We, we know 2005 is going to be interesting for him. We didn't know how interesting until New Year's Eve 2004 when Agan Isu, which is Brother Yashi, Shuji Kondo, Toru Washi, uh, Takuya Sugawara, and Jet Shogo Takagi, they are dismissed from Dragon Gate due to, quote, neglected duty and poor conduct. Mike, your thoughts on the Agon Isu dismissal nearly 20 years after the fact? Yeah, this is one of those things that I recently kind of was going through. Just I like seeing how the internet kind of devolves, like especially as, as how it does information. And one of the things that I feel like Covering Dragon Gate, we provide a service that I think is kind of important is that now we have these autumn audio testaments that exist where, case, I was desperately trying to pull up a, at least a somewhat current uh, Open the Brave Gate 2000, uh, March 13, 2005 card from iHeartDG at that time. It's, it's really hard to do. There's just not a lot of sourcing that is still out there. Because of how the internet exists, caching and everything, you have to go spelunking to do so. And Agoniso's dismissal, and I know that we use quotation marks and allegedly, and it's one of those things that, by and large, as farther as we get away from it, I mean, we're on the 20th anniversary year of it, it's still one of those situations that I feel like that the full and absolute story will never be told in a lot of ways as a lot of these things, or at least not told necessarily towards a public audience but i do feel like it's something where whatever happened at that alleged uh, geora christmas uh function whatever it had leading up to it it was all very clear that it there needed to be a severance between the former Aganisu and dragon gate and that happened at that time yeah because the story for the longest time that i i think we all took as fact was that Agan Isu, and it was likely Yashi specifically, sort of mouthed off of this. I don't know if it was Guy or if it was Sky Perfect TV, because, you know, they, they had the Sky Perfect deal at the time that mouthed off at a corporate Christmas party and embarrassed Dragon Gate in front of their sponsors. And, and Dragon Gate said, well, this is not going to work for us, brother. You guys need to go. Of course, I've always uh, said, if you look at the booking patterns of 2004 Torimon to 2004 Dragon Gate, the first half of the year, it is the Agon Isu promotion. They are the most dominant thing. They are in main events. They are winning main events. And you see them with the changeover be phased out more and more and more. And they become really this incredibly weak heel unit by the end of their time. And I think now, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm of the belief of, you know, it was more of a, not quite as friendly as like, hey, Shingo, go be a superstar in New Japan but closer to a Shingo exit than a Shima exit, if you know what I mean. You, you see, I feel like this is actually one of those times that I think that there it was closer to a Shima and Magnum situation than it was a Shingo. I think that everyone was just sick and tired of each other. And that if you look, I, I think a way of looking at the booking is that they fell very far out of a favor. And it was something where it was going to break and it was just this group is just not working for the overall, I guess, health of the company, I feel like. Yeah, that is that is a fair assessment at the very least. So into 2005, you have no heel unit. 
you have a promotion that had lost Taru and Sua and now all of these Aganisu guys. You're still looking to develop your identity as what is Dragon Gate? Is it just Toriumon under a new name or is it this other promotion? You start the year uh, with a Triangle Gate match. Mori, Milano, and Yoshino, they defeat Kness, Doi, and Susumu in a Triangle Gate match when Yoshino pinned Doi. Uh, and after that, Doi really uh, started thinking about his time in Final M2K and how it probably wasn't going to take him where he needed to be. And Mike, this leads us to one of the most pivotal nights in company history, January 14th, 2005. I am uh, calling our shot now. We will do a full rewind and rewatch for this show, January of 2025, Mike. I think we should do a 20-year anniversary okay. of this show. Is that okay? Yeah, because I have a lot of stuff that I could add to this show that would be better for that. Yes, you yeah. Know, we'll, we'll, this is one of the best Dragon Gate shows ever. We'll do a full breakdown of it 10 months from now. Buckle up, everybody. Stay tuned. The, but, the time for Waku Waku Fuji Land is not now. That no. is, This is not the show for that. Common misconception. Everybody thinks it's now. It's not. There's another time for that. It's we'll 10 get months to from it. now. 10 months. We'll get to it when we get to it. But January 14th, 2005... All that was known going into this show was that Shima was going to debut his new unit. People didn't know who was going to be in the unit. They didn't know what the unit was going to be. But after the the dissolution of Crazy Max at the end of 2004, Shima, the biggest star in the company, needed a unit. In January of 2005, he was going to get it. One of the things that I picked up on listening to the old iHeartDG podcast, and Mike, let me just throw this fantasy scenario at you was that there was a strong belief at the time that Shima's unit was going to be Agon Isu and that it was a work and they were just going to bring these guys back and have Shima lead that unit. Have you heard this before? What are your thoughts on it hearing now? Or what are your thoughts on it hearing it now? It is something that uh, I remember that uh, nugget from that podcast too. <laughs> uh, I think it is something where time was really ripe for Shima to do the heel turn because you completely lost every single heel you had in very short order. You you, you were not going to be able to turn Italian Italian connection back heel. That's just not a possibility. You had a real conundrum where not only did you lose Taru and Sua, who were the real heat behind Crazy Max, even though Crazy Max at this point uh, 2004, other than when they went combat mode, was a face unit. You were really at a time where you had to completely refigure out your whole entire unit landscape. And it's one of those things that I know that a friend of the show, Mark A.H. Gutstozer, that has put up a new video talking about the issue right now with Dragon Gate and units and all the unaffiliated. But you had a time in in 2005 where you essentially have to completely shuffle the deck and there are certain other things that would happen in early 2005 that would cause you to shuffle it even further but the first thing you had to do or one one and two was what is your heel unit and what are you going to do with the biggest star in your company shima and his brand new unit it makes a lot of sense why uh if you want to go murphy's law that makes the most sense you put so, Shima as a heel unit and Agoniso as a big swerve. It would have been a great swerve. Um, it would have been fantastic. But Shima instead starts the show. It's him and Fuji and Shingo. And they come to the ring and uh, they have this opening promo. And they announce Blood Generation. They, they don't announce at the time whether it's babyface or heel. They just say that the concept of the unit was strength, pure blood, and and no masked wrestlers, which meant no Stalker Chikawa because he was weak, and no Super Shisa because he wore a mask. Then we have the opening match of the show, and it's Daruki Doi and Masaki Mochizuki, the final M2K guys, versus Dragon Kid and Kenichiro Arai. And Shima, Shingo, and Fuji come out to the ring. Daruki Doi hits Masaki Mochizuki with a Bakatari sliding kick. He turns heel and there is no other way to say it other than in that moment, shit got very real, Mike. Yeah, the, this is a thing that I think it is kind of hard, even I think for 2014 and 2015 uh, Dragon Gate viewers to kind of comprehend. When Naruki Doi turned heel, and we'll talk about this because the, the heel turn gets even more cemented throughout this Open the Brave Gate uh, championship show case. 
it is something where there's a level of violence and fear to him that just comes off it just bounces off the screen that does not happen before it is the thing that you had shima fuji and shingo they were all members of crazy max like we expected that trio to stick around together especially shima and fuji in 2005 that they were the married team but having doi turn and turn the way that he did in the amount of viciousness completely cements blood generation as the leading heel force going forward in january of 2005 so the main event of this show becomes a two out of three falls eight-man tag match. It's Shima, Don, Fuji, Naruki Doi, and Shingo against Magnum, Dragon Kid, Genki, and Super Shisa. Shima wins the first fall. Shisa wins the second fall. And then Doi destroys Dragon Kid again, this time with a Bakatari sliding kick in the main event. Doi wins. The promotion is shell-shocked. And Blood Generation, Dragon Gate's first original unit, are off to the races. And uh, just for new viewers, and we'll, we'll be having more things this month about Blood Generation and important matches they were involved in in the month of March. But uh, how would you define Blood Generation, real quick? A uh, steroid obsessed, egotistical heel unit that could back up every bit of the bullshit that they spoke. It was something where. Uh, modern Dragon Gate fans are used to drag uh, are used to Dragon Gate getting kind of real whenever Don Fuji or veterans are in the ring with uh, rookies and like the gut check matches and like those kind of things. Blood Generation was that all the time. This was Don Fuji doing that to everyone at that point. It is. And there's a lot of things when we review this show that we're going to go, hey, they did this in 2005. Why are they not doing this in 2024? But the raw intensity of Blood Generation, the way they presented themselves, the way that they almost forced the camera to be on them at all times, and it's a credit to Shima more than anybody, because Shima at this time was in the fucking zone. But they commanded such a level of attention, they were so intense, and they were so charismatic and I don't care if it's Dragon Gate, New Japan, All Japan, NOAA, or DDT, the Japanese landscape is desperately missing this right now. Yeah, and not to uh, uh, make this uh, Rewindery Watch completely, you know, a, a relic of March of 2024, watching this tournament and watching Blood Generation and the way that they come off, in a time where we've seen heel units kind of, it, it, for lack of better terms, just be tired and done. You see a certain level of vibrance where you say like Shima is like it completely pulling focus. That's what this unit is at a time where Dragon Gate, I mean, we have not done the Ultimo split episode of a rewind and rewatch, but when we get to that point, it is really very much 2000. And four, that fall was solidifying and making sure everyone knows this is Dragon Gate. This is what we are. We are here. We're not with Ultimo now, but we are that promotion you remember. And now we're trying to go out there for an awareness thing. In 2005, you immediately had to, you, you were bailing out water at a rate of, oh, the real shocks happened at that point, And you needed to have a unit that was able to pull focus when you have Essentially, case uh, not to completely jump ahead of you here, one of the big popular units would no longer be apart. Basically, by the time of this tournament, it would fall a piece. Would it would fall apart in a period of weeks? Well, and it's a perfect you... segue. It's a perfect segue because February eighteenth, two thousand five. Again, we talked about how Dragon Gate lost Sua, they lost Taru, they lost Aganisu. The biggest blow yet. They lose Magnum Tokyo. He works his final Dragon Gate match February eighteenth, two thousand five. Like I said. He would take time off due to a leg injury. Uh, the thought was always that he would return. And then in April of 2005, it became official that, no, he was actually done with Dragon Gate for good. Yeah, and at that point, you had Italian Connection, who the big storyline you kind of did in 2004 was Italian Connection versus Agoniso, as Agoniso, for those who do not know, was mainly formed by the heel portions of Italian Connection, 
not wanting to stop cheating. And then you, so you had Anthony W. Morey joining up with this unit, teaming with Milano Collection 18 and Yosino, and they become the first Open the Triangle Gate champions. Now your first champions have to immediately vacate the title. And before you know it, this unit that you've already had to replace Crazy Max. You've already had to replace your heel unit. You have Final M2K, who, case, I don't think I'm exaggerating when, I, when I'm when i saying this, was not necessarily knocking them dead in 2005. Do Fixer was fine, but the rest of the unit landscape now is it was in a such a precarious place that made the advent of Blood Generation even more important because you can go back to some of those old uh, trademarks of Tori Monseki Gun versus Crazy Max or Tori Monseki Gun versus Crazy Max versus M2K. You're able to do that now that you have the strong heel unit, but you did then immediately lose your other big face unit right here. In a rare moment of optimism, it's why the impending unit shuffle and current Dragon Gate is so important because I think they're in a very similar situation even if they're more impacted by just injury than departure, although the the loss of SP Kento still does sting in a real way. And, you know, depending on the day, Takuma Fujiwara, uh, his exit still stings in a real way. Dragon Gate at the end of 2004 was not a promotion that was on fire. It was a promotion that had raw talent. There was stuff there, but it was the formation of Blood Generation. It was the rise of Naruki Doi. It was the ungodly amount of uh, focus that turned out to be a massive success, at least in the calendar year of 2005, of Rio Saito, of making him a main eventer. And then it was the introduction of Shingo in a real way. It was the introduction of BB Hulk. It was the introduction of Akira Tozawa. It was those things that made this promotion so special. And I really genuinely believe 2024 Dragon Gate is not all that different than 2004 Dragon Gate and if they play their cards right, they can very, very easily shift into a 2005 Dragon Gate mindset sooner rather than later. Absolutely. So we have now a vacated Triangle Gate belt. Uh, we should say at this point, Dreamgate champion is now Masaki Mochizuki. We turn the calendar into March case, and it's time to finally replace that NWA welterweight belt. Yes, so the March tour is the Open the Brave Gate tour because they were going to crown their first ever Brave Gate champion. This was created to replace the NWA Welterweight Championship, and the Brave Gate belt initially consisted of eight individual puzzle pieces that when you put them together formed a title belt, Mike. Yep, and up until uh, Eita destroyed the original belt. Uh, this is the belt that lasts the longest case. Actually, Triangle Gate, they had to replace one of the Triangle Gates due to the... Uh, uh, built uh, shortage that happened after Kobe World 2015. But the story of the Brave Gate is whenever it vacated, the front plate was uh, taken apart. I guess it was just a high powered magnet, basically, that it was magnetized for this. And you would do an eight person tournament that over the tournament, everyone would be given the piece and you would rebuild the belt. And then the winner of the tournament would finally have the rebuilt uh, open the Brave Gate title belt. It would be that way basically through 2019 with that. The other thing that happens on the tour case, so it starts off in Hokkaido, and in, and one of the first shows on that show, who debuts case? B.B. Hulk, the second graduate of the Dragon Gate Dojo. Yep, he debuts in Hokkaido. Very yep. important for 20 years later, very important. Yeah, the Magnum Tokyo produced debut. Hulk comes out with the girls, does the dance. He looks very pretty. Magnum Tokyo uh, thought he had just endless potential. He loses to Susumu in his debut, but is a very good debut match. I want to highlight real quick before we get to the Brave Gate tournament itself, March 6th of 2005. If you're listening to this, if you've never really seen 2005 Dragon Gate, March 6, 2005, there's a two out of three falls match for the vacant Triangle Gate belts. It's Dragon Kid, Genki Horiguchi, and Ryo Saito against Shimo, Naruki Doi, and Shingo Takagi. This match is unbelievable. It is one of the best matches of 2005. I highly recommend you go seek it out. It is one of those matches that when we when we talk about 33106 kind of get compared to it by the uh, Dragon Gate old heads, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the other Blood Generation versus Doofixer matches that 
like ditch uploaded this match but i think he only uploaded the third fall i don't think the first two are slow or bad by any means i think the full match is very uh much worth seeking out but it is uh, from a purely in-ring standpoint on the level of 33106 it just doesn't have the chicago ridge crowd that made it what it was and you have uh rookie shingo takagi who is in for masato yoshino at that time and it kind of is something where Shingo is such a fun uh, rookie to watch at that time, but it is kind of one of those things that it, it kind of changes the complexion of it. And then finally, on March 8th, 2005, they run in Cork and Hall. Main event, Kness, Naoki Tanizaki, and Yoshino. They defeat Daniel Mishima, Genki Horiguchi, and Super Shisa. This is the first ever Cork and Hall main event that doesn't have Shima, Magnum, Milano, or Mochi in it, and it is a preview for this Open the Brave Gate Championship tournament. Yeah, uh, th- th- that's the fun uh, trivia question, is that Daniel Mishma in this main event. Yeah, who would have thought, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So let's go over real quick before we review this entire show. Let's go over the participants of the Brave Gate tournament. This was from the Nagoya International Conference Hall, a building that we still talk about to this day. They were just there. A very, very important building. Uh, Daniel Mishima. A T2P graduate, he spent a good chunk of his career getting squashed by Sua, uh, briefly in Shin M2K, but by this point, he was fully locked into the Florida Brothers and was known for his comedy wrestling, but he insisted throughout this entire tournament that he would be wrestling in a serious style. I'll rifle through these names and you can give your thoughts afterwards. Uh, Genki Horiguchi, second-term student, two-time welterweight champion. He was currently one-third of the Triangle Gate champions with Dragon Kid and Ryo Saito and Doofixer. Kness was a former welterweight champion who became synonymous with the title. He was in final M2K at the time. Naoki Tanizaki was the one Torimon X graduate that survived the chaos of 2004, and he was a do fixer member at this time as well. Naruki Doi, we've talked about enough. This was his year. This was his time. We have the man known as Psycho, all caps Psycho in this tournament. He is a Kayantai Dojo graduate. And I will table uh, future psycho thoughts for his match. How about that, Mike? Yeah, I feel like that we kind of, it, it's better to talk about him in the moment. Yes, I, I would agree with that. You have Super Shisa, who was uh, at this time representing the brand new Poss Heart stable. It was him and Magnum and BB Hulk. And he was a British wrestling aficionado. He had competed numerous times for the welterweight belt as Saito and as Shisa, but had never won it. And then you had all caps Yoshino. And I think this is really important to note before we get into this tournament. He won the welterweight belt, like I said, March 22nd, 2003, and he never lost it. It's important to note, and I talked about this when Yoshino retired, how important this specific era of his career is because people don't realize how protected he was in 2003 and 2004 and 2005. He was far more protected at this point that even Milano was, even though Milano was still the leader of the Italian connection, from the point in which he won the belt in March of 2003 in singles matches, he only lost against Shima in the El Numero Uno 2003 semifinals, Toro Washi in the 2004 El Numero Uno block play, and Shima at Kobe World 2004 in the Ultimo Dragon Gym Championship Tournament. He also went to time limit draws against Milano in 2003, and Arakan and Susumu in El Numero Uno 2004, as well as a double pin in Mexico against Taiji Ishimori. But Mike, Masato Yoshino by this point was going on a two-year singles match, a nearly undefeated streak, an absurd winning percentage at the very least. Yeah, and at this point, it is kind of worth pointing out, like the welterweight run he had becomes the one that y- you said in Torimon Japan, it's about Sua in 1999 and 2000. The belt really becomes about Yoshino. And it is kind of the belt that I would argue that if we're talking about pre-Dragon Gate days, if you're talking about Mr. NWA Welterweight, it becomes Yoshino because he runs through everyone. And it's kind of an interesting kind of thing we talk about T2P and how the rankings kind of went because... It is something where you kind of have two things happening. You have Yoshino, the very strong welterweight champion, not dropping a fall, basically, as you describe it and how protected he is. And you have Milano, who 
dropping all kinds of falls, always the one kind of needing to uh, kind of pull himself back up. And I think that was intentional It because Milano was the highest rated person and was the person that they were going to base the future around more so than Yoshino. Having Yoshino be the kind of the silent backup, the incredibly precise technician behind the courageous uh, Milano Collection AT just makes all the sense in the world. But my, my trivia question for you, Case, is so famously, of course, Milano Collection AT ranked first in the Torimon 2000 class. Uh, who is ranked second along with Yoshino, all caps? So is this in terms of push? Oh, no, this was like the, the there was like a ranking that was kind of released at one time. That oh, we oh. only really have a couple of the rankings uh, remembered due to the passage of time. Who was ranked tied second with Yoshino? Oh, um, OK. T2P class tied second with Yoshino. Uh, was it Philip J. Fukumasa? I like where your head's at, but no. It who, is. Who, who was it? <laughs> Brother Stevie Sujimoto. Oh, of course. Yep. Brother Yashi technically was second. That's why there was the Nanking fucking wrestling team. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's, Actually that's good, good at Yave, uh, uh, Brother Yashi. Yeah. I'll, I'll, it's funny to think about Brother Yashi as almost like a wrong place, wrong time guy, but we, we, we almost hit that point with him. He was at least very fun at T2P. So those are your competitors for the Brave Gate tournament. That is the history of how we got here, which admittedly took a little bit longer than I thought it was going to, but that's okay. Because, Mike, we have this glorious Open the Brave Gate Championship title tournament show, March 13th, 2005. Off the bat, let's talk presentation. This show, and this is another thing that I think is missing not only from Dragon Gate in 2024, but all of Japanese wrestling. You turn this show on, it feels like a party. There are glow sticks, there is loud music, the crowd is into it. This, from a visual standpoint, is such an engaging show. And I think this was such a important trademark that we talked about King of Dragon 1999, the uh, Torimon Japan landing uh, in January, and how the big thing said about Torimon was it was not just like going to a wrestling show, it's like going to a party, it's going to the nightclub. And one of the through lines that I feel like that they really hammered home, especially in these early uh, 2004, 2005, I would say by 2007, they kind of faded this away. They made a big point of having these big touch points. And especially on these live pay-per-views that they would do, they used to do essentially monthly live pay-per-views with Sky Perfect. That is the version that I believe Case is putting up for y'all. It's the version I watched at least yes and having the pay-per-view money coming in allowed them to do such things as having all of those glow sticks having uh the different cameras and having just the overall kind of feeling that they were able to pull off here of just this night being kind of a special thing yes so for those that don't know the dragon gate tv in 2005 it's very simple to follow you would have your monthly gaiora show which was maybe Kobe, maybe Hokkaido, maybe Osaka. It would follow the Dragon Gate Tour. And then you would have these Sky Perfect pay-per-views, which for most months was just the Cork and Hall show, and you would get Cork in, in full. But in March and in July, and I think those were the only two months, they had other pay-per-views. So you have the Brave Gate show here, then in July you have Kobe World. So the Cork and show got shifted to Gaiora, and you get the full version of these pay-per-views through Sky Perfect. Yeah, and this was also a time that they would be running a lot more different venues inside of Tokyo for these monthly pay-per-views. Because I feel like Arake, whenever they would run Ariake, different Ariake, those often were the Sky Perfect shows as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we get one in April because that's when Yoshino turns. Spoiler alert, I apologize. <laughs> if it's a spoiler for you at this point that Masato Yoshino is a member of Blood Generation, then I don't know what to say. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, Mike, let's get into this show, if you don't mind. Uh, let's uh, let's break this down match by match, and I, I turn it over to you for the opener uh, of the tournament, Yoshino versus Kness. Yeah, so this is Yoshino and Kness. This is a rematch of their long series at this point. This one was, at this point case, their fourth uh, singles match. They, of course, had the series of matches for the NWA World Welterweight title. There was also 
a spicy little match they had at the end of twenty of two thousand and two in T two P. But this was the first time they had a singles match in uh, Dragon Gate proper. They did this to open up the show after a full kind of introduction where Psycho and Naoki Tanizaki case they get into it. But in this first open round opening round matchup, the first quarterfinal of the first open the Brave Gate Championship, we have Masato Yoshino. Yosino, all caps, advancing over Kness with a pin cutback after a Hikari no wall, a intense finishing stretch. One of, I think, their meteor singles matches up to this point. I feel like this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the this is the trademark uh, Yoshino Kness hot fighting match. This match is unbelievable, and it, it it is really more than just a greatest hits. I started to think with this it's match, meaty. yeah, exactly. You know, I started to think it was like, all right, you know, opening round of the tournament. I see the direction they're going in. This is going to be good. It's Yoshino and Kness. There's no way it's going to be bad, but you know, it's it's going to be on the lower end. But it's not. This match goes up a level. It's a 14 minute opener. The the limb work in a few of these matches, and this is one of them, but there's a few different matches on this show where I kind of marveled at the intensity of the limb work and the way that some of these guys were picked apart. And in this match, it's the knees of Yoshino and it's the arm of Kness, and they just keep on trading blows on these limbs time after time again. Then you get into this finishing stretch with all the counters and the submissions. And this, to me is maybe the issue that the brave gate belt still has because yes you have like your iconic pock run and you have the big dragon kid run from a decade ago but what i want from the brave gate belt fair or unfair is tricked out grappling like this and it it's few and far between in modern day dragon gate yeah and this one i feel like in the series of Yosino and Kness really is the match about the Sol Naciente because there's a lot of working around it, a lot of Kness trying to roll through and turning the uh, uh, the Sol Naciente into like a mo- into a Darkness Buster uh, variant, but it's all based around Kness's shoulder and how Yoshino is able to kind of pick it apart until he gets to a point where it, it, it's known at this point that Kness is the premier counter wrestler in dragon gate and yoshino is able to show that he was able to counter out counter the counter wrestler and i feel like it's just one of those like phenomenal ways to kick off this tournament especially considering how the remainder of the quarterfinal round would go case i feel like it was so important to have this match be match one given the stories that will happen between psycho and then also the story that Nuriki Doi will have throughout this tournament. You needed to have this uh, Brave Gate Classic to kick off the tournament. And it is that. This is a notebook match easy, well worth your time. Yoshino versus Kness was outstanding. Absolutely. I would go probably, it, it, it's definitely notebook. It's one of those things that each time I watch it, I find something else with it. I think I'm just a happy four and a half stars on it. It's just, it, it, is, it becomes the second longest match in this tournament is this match is this one right here. We move on to Psycho versus Naoki Tanizaki. Psycho representing K-Dojo. He defeats Naoki Tanizaki with a high fly bomb in 3 minutes and 17 seconds. A high fly bomb is a springboard uh, swanton bomb. But Case, the real magic here is the magic of a man called Psycho. I mean, God, this is where I gotta throw it back to you momentarily, but... You know, the, the Dragon Gate K-Dojo relationship is very prosperous in 2005, and there's some good that comes with it. There are some K-Dojo guys that wrestle in this company that, you know, were they necessarily on the par of the high-end Dragon Gate guys? No, but I, I thought by and large, you know, that they hold their own in a few of their appearances here. You know, especially there's like a, a, a Doi and Yoshino. Uh, you say it again? I was going to say Madoka, really, yes. is kind of the one of the big ones. But yeah, I would say that uh, it, it kind of in the aughts, their strongest promotional partner, other than their a couple random Noah relationships and shows that go down south pretty badly, is this K-Dojo one, and it's Shima and Taka there. Yep. Yeah, so you get Psycho from here. And uh, uh, Mike, I was told you have a bountiful Psycho notes to deliver to us. So Psycho is this kind of fascinating 
wrestler. He has a lot of gimmicks. He goes through a lot of characters. What I find fascinating, Case, is he's a former Marines mask. And there's a lot of Marines masks out there. He is listed as Marines mask number two. That was kind of his uh, mid-2010s gimmick. Uh, another famous Marines mask is uh, Yuki Sato, a.k.a. Uh, Amikusa. Uh, is a former Marines mask. And it is something where you would have, especially in K-Dojo, they would want to have their own kind of version of a tiger's mask and have that kind of figure and that they would always, because it was based in Chiba, okay, so here is a Japanese baseball kind of thing for you. So Osaka Pro is based in Osaka. The Hanshin Tigers, who are the team of the Osaka and Osaka area, is based there so that's why they had tiger's mask not tiger mask tiger's mask for osaka pro k dojo and now 2aw were based in chiba who is the home of the chiba lot marines so marines mask was kind of playing off of the tiger's mask but also when you have their own character here the thing about psycho is that he kind of uh i'm trying to remember this guy he appears, uh, he's the guy behind Wallaby, uh, Keita Yano. He has kind of that vibe going off with him in 2005, I would say, right? Yeah, it's like a weird, uh, like, I, I think he's trying to do punk rock, but it, it kind of comes across as like a weird, uh, like, he's not a skinhead, but there's like a, I, I got like skinhead vibes from it. The whole thing is very off-putting. I, I will say that much. Uh, it, the The presentation of him is bizarre. And his whole thing, what was the name of his finish? The the high fly bomb? Yeah, high fly bomb. The springboard, uh, very high angle swanton bomb. Yeah, it's just a springboard swanton. I mean, it looks good, but it's it's just that. That's his whole thing. That is the reason he's brought in, and he fucks it up in this tournament. He fucks it up in this match. And you can hear it when he goes to springboard in this match. The crowd makes noise. They know this is the one thing that he does, and then he botches it, and he's never brought back. Baseball fans, are you excited for the upcoming season? I know I am. It is time to gear up and show your team spirit with MLB Shop, the official online store of Major League Baseball. Find the latest jerseys, hats, apparel, and collectibles for all 30 MLB teams at MLB Shop. Represent your favorite players, your hometown team, or relive classic moments with exclusive throwback gear. Gear up for the season at MLB Shop. Whether you're cheering from the stands or watching at home, show your love for the game with official MLB merchandise. Make sure you use our exclusive link, voicesofwrestling.com slash MLB shop to help support the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Again, it's voicesofwrestling.com slash MLB shop. You'll pay the exact same price, the exact same items. Everything is exactly the same about your shopping experience, but a small percentage of every sale comes back to us. So again, it's voicesofwrestling.com slash MLB shop, the official online store of Major League Baseball. Yeah, he also does his own version of the Sol Naciente in every single match. I can't imagine anyone was very happy about that. No, no, I would, I would say not. <laughs> so, but uh, he go, he runs through Naoki Tanizaki. Right now, we have two pieces of the belt uh, added to it. Do you have any other uh, Naoki Tanizaki and Psycho thoughts here? Uh, should should we go through quickly uh, the turbulence of Naoki Tanizaki? Uh, go go for it quickly, yeah. So uh, Naoki is the Tormon two thousand or the Tormon X graduate who makes it. He kind of is already ingratiated, and because of Magnum and uh, and Do Fixer, there's a lot. Uh, one of the other sides of the Agani so uh, departure was a. It I don't know, and I don't want to tell stories out of school. There was a story about Agani so and uh hazing naoki tanizaki in training that kind of came up there he went through the ringer he would be out of dragon gate i think by the end of this year in 2005 for the first time yeah if not 05 then early 06 yeah uh, he bounces around between the uh, dragon system affiliates and comes back in the uh, world one days in 2008 before departing kind of acrimoniously in 2020 so, yeah, Naoki Tanizaki, really good in 2005. It's a shame he got bounced in the first round, and especially by way of Psycho. 
Yep. And then we have our third semifinal, Naoki, uh, uh, not Naoki Tanizaki, Naruki Doi versus Super Shisa. So this match initially goes to a no contest. The match is completely thrown out after uh, Shingo gets involved. Shisa does a dive onto him. Then it breaks down essentially into a pause hearts and blood generation scrum gm yazushi kanda who he is general manager at this point forces a restart as we're not gonna let this match go completely to ways we're not gonna ruin the first tournament because of uh blood generation being a bunch of buttheads but naoki um, i'm calling him naoki again naruki doi advances onto the semifinals after the match is restarted very quickly with a uh bakatari sliding kick on super shisa this is brutal this rules yeah, okay, I'm so glad you're on the same page as me, where this is the car crash, uh, dare I say, sports entertainment, Torimon style, really rearing its head with blood generation being overbearing, being dominant. You can't ignore them. And Shisa is just the perfect foil. Remember, he gets kicked out of his own, uh, you know, out of, out of the Shima unit. It was Waka Waka Fuji Land. They say no masked wrestlers, and then they bring in Naruki Doi and turn heel. So you have that level of spite building up over two months. And then these guys go out there and just kill each other. I mean, this is an elite. There's elite Doi performances on this show. Doi is incredible. But this is one where you just go away going, man, Super Shisa, uh, forever underrated, you know, forever underappreciated because he was incredible on in this match. So the finish, I did a little bit of a disservice saying it's just a Bakatari sliding kick. So the restart happens. It must be really annoying if you're Naruki Doi trying to do your big heel turn and you're with this guy who wants to do Lancashire Shire grappling. <laughs> uh, he goes for a rounding press off the post trying to get him in a crossbody. Doi gets him on his fold, his shoulders, throws him down hard with the Doi's five and does the Bakatari sliding kick. The crowd already is hatred. There's utter hatred in Rookie Doi at this point of the evening. You know, if you take away Psycho messing up his finish, you just look at these first three matches, and it continues into the fourth, but it's like you get a barn burner in Yoshino and Kness. You get this outsider who, at the very least, was intriguing, again, before the finish, where it's like, okay, he goes over. You know, I like Tanizaki, but no harm in him losing. Yeah, and he was the lowest ranked guy in the tournament. Yes, was, exactly. Like, yeah, and then you and then you have Shisa versus Doi, which serves two purposes because one, it's a great match, but it also just reinvigorates this blood generation thing because this would have been, I think, their first time in Nagoya. Period is blood generation, so it's the first time this crowd has seen this act. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. And they come out in you know, in case you had missed Corkin and in case you hadn't watched TV. They just establish what these guys are perfectly in this match, and then Doi still comes out ahead, and it's just all perfectly laid out. Yeah, and it's something that they build on throughout the show. Uh, the it, it, And it's presentation-wise, one thing that if they really want to do the nerdy, uh, gay nostalgia thing, case, the thing they got to bring back, that we can't have like the uh, current uh, preview graphics where it's the two guys on the sc where it's the guys on the screen and it's that same guitar whale that happens every single time. We need to have the uh, computer animated uh, steel cage graphics because that is a vibe that I really meant. It is not the prettiest graphic, but man, no. does it, it makes my heart warm whenever I see it. Yeah, it is something that I feel like, and I wonder if this is something that is replicated with native fans but i feel like if you're someone that i i mean case even by the time you were getting into the promotion and following it uh like in modern day they were away from that but it feels like up until the Ustream days this was like the preferred graphic style and it was always something that i kind of always go back to whenever i see like the full cut version of a show especially like this one of the pay-per-views where we got out all of this like this is the whole show in full and it is one of those kind of touches that you kind of cut back in. Everyone comes out and then they do the introductions and you get the graphic and you're right out of the way. It's just a touch I meant. Yeah, it's very much a time and place. And, you know, again, they, they did it very well. They utilized these graphics well. And you're right. By the time I started following the promotion, it was gone. But it also it was kind of a noticeable thing that all of the classic matches, all of the hyped matches that I was binging at the time 
they all they all had that cage match graphic and so thus i am i am very much a fan of it yep bring it back for the next gate of nostalgia the last quarterfinal matchup we have is daniel mishima versus ginky horiguchi daniel mishima serious daniel gets the win with the danny yell it's a wrist clutch side suplex uh hold on ginky horiguchi the florida brother and his serious wrestling advances on and advances past a former nwa welterweight champion at the time one of the biggest wins of daniel mishima's career yeah this kicks ass too because horiguchi is not only a former champion but he's mr tournament you know he's coming off of el numero uno 2003 that was only two years ago and you see it here you know you see a backslide from heaven attempt uh which gets a huge pop and it, it, there's a there's a big kick out and then you have mishima who is just he's not awesome in the way that a doi or a yoshino or kness is awesome because they're technically proficient but he's he's playing in quotes he's playing serious wrestler and it gets over so well and then his finish is uh, you know more or less it's like morishima's backdrop driver it looks killer and he dumps horiguchi on his head and gets the win and it just goes to show the first round of this tournament was just perfect and uh, this was the moment rewatching this that uh so we didn't really talk too much about what happens to daniel mishima after this he is this is like one of his last hundred matches he has like we're getting towards the end of this uh, he retires really in 2007, though he makes a couple appearances in, in 2006. But 2007, he's done. He transfers over to K- to uh, KSK office. He goes over and he becomes like the, after Kazuhiko Nakajima and Kento Miyahara, he becomes the third member of that. And this is a match where I'm like, all right, I see why Sasaki wanted him to join at this match i was like because he rocks in this it's one of those things that he's kind of like this doofy guy who's just suddenly like destroying uh ginky horiguchi here i love it this is a really fun match absolutely so that was our first round we have in the second round coming up after this yosino versus psycho naruki doi versus uh daniel mishima we do have here final m2k versus do fixer plus Sachi Hoko Machine in this next one. Masaki Mochizuki, who is at the time the reigning Open the Dreamgate champion, gets the win over Sachi with a rather uh, mean and brutal twister when at a moment Masaki Mochizuki remembers, oh, I'm the Dreamgate champion here. Why am I putting up with this with Sachi? Yeah, no, this is actually a very fun six-man. It's perhaps a little too long at 13 minutes, but it's a good showcase for this specific show. Because we haven't really talked about Rio Saito, but 2005 is all about making Rio Saito a star. And in a match against Mochi, the Dreamgate champion, and Susumu, who is Susumu even by this point, I mean, Rio Saito looks like a star in this match. He looks awesome. Yeah, and this is, at least for me, when I think about peak Rio Saito, it's him and the orange and black uh, short tights. Oh, you know? it's, it's 2005 is the peak. It is. Yeah, it, it's literally it's January through December 2005, January 2006. It all goes wrong and it's never really the same again. Yeah, but he feels like a star here. I was uh, just so like get a sense of rating wise. I was three and a half on both the other semi uh, quarterfinals matches. I was three and three quarters on this. This is just an absolute blast here. And especially like mochi at this time going up against uh rio saito felt like that in their exchanges it felt like okay this is the time rio saito feels like he's not there right now but he will be soon uh up to this point in the show i had gone four on kness and yoshino two and three quarters on psycho and tanizaki three and three quarters on shisa and doi three and a quarter on Horiguchi and Mishima. And then I went three and a quarter on this match, but I also thought it was just boatloads of fun. Absolutely. And then we went into intermission. Uh, I, did you sit through the intermission on the, the cut there? Cause they had some wild things go on here. Uh, uh, Yoshihiro Takayama versus uh, soccer Chikawa and the debut of BB Hulk versus Asumu Yokosuka. I did not sit through it this time, but Stalker versus Takayama is one of the best Stalker matches. And the BB, the BB Hulk debut, you can watch that at a few different places. Uh, it's it's a very good debut match. It It is. It, it is one of those things that you kind of go like, God, 
this is one week into BB Hulk's career. We'll talk about him in a second. Let's get through the semifinals here. Yoshino advances over Psycho after he gets really fed up with the guy and plants him with another space. Yeah, not a uh, not a pretty match, not a uh, particularly good one. I mean, it was Psycho after all. But Yoshino just, I mean, he really, by the end of it, just beats the hell out of him and gets the win and goes on to the finals as he should. It is like the moment where you go like, oh, yeah, this is Masato Yoshino. This is what (laughs) because it was very much like one of those like end of the matches case that we've probably seen a hundred times of Yoshino where he just kind of decides I'm done with this. Yeah, it, it feels like a shoot where it's like, all right, this match is over in three, two, one. Thank you. He is not to the level that I expect here. He has already used my finish a lot during the show here. How am I getting out of this match? Oh, I'm going to do my crazy pump handle slam and throw him down like a sack of potatoes. (laughs) So we had that. Yoshino advancing on to the final. The other semifinal, Naruki Doi versus Daniel Mishima. Uh, It is a... uh, Doi advances by referee decision here uh the story happens that uh during a stretch where uh mishima goes into the ropes and he's about to do a plancha naruki doi picks up a chair and throws it at him busts him open really bad the crowd is just livid at naruki doi and at that point like maku it it it, it is something where you have the crowd just completely bawling as Michael Owasa is trying to bring Daniel Mishima in the back, but Mishima is not giving up on it. And Kanda is just completely just destroying Doi on commentary, just loses it on him at that point. Yeah, it, it's a ref stoppage via blood loss, I think is the official finish on this match. Yeah, it is one of those things that the uh, the camera, like he crumples onto the apron, down to the floor, and you go like, oh God, that was a rough kind of spot here and you don't realize until he turns around and the back of his head is bright red and you see a little bit of a gash form up until that point uh daniel goes for the danielle and then naruki doi goes nope i'm naruki doi this is my night and we're not doing this and then proceeds to try to destroy daniel mishima you know what this match was and this is this is perhaps a homework assignment for you in the same way that a few years ago, I listed every great punch Tamanaga match in history. Mm-hmm. This was Territory Doi. This ter- was Territory Doi. Territory Doi is not somebody that we see often. We saw it against John Moxley in your, in your territory in 2011. We saw it here against uh, uh, Daniel Mishima. You got to find all of the Territory Doi matches out there and let us know what they are. Yeah, I mean, we're in Nagoya here. I think at this show was a young UT who was just like, holy crap, Naruki Doi just destroyed that guy. <laughs> this is like, there are those, um, like those punk goes pop albums. This is like Dragon Gate goes Crockett. It's just Doi is just living it up in the, in the most evil and most beautiful way possible. Yeah, this, the real story of the Open the Brave Gate uh, tournament for those who don't know how this story is going to end is Naruki Doi is no longer the baseball geek anymore. Naruki Doi is very much, I would say, coming out of this night close to fully formed. Like I would say that, as we say, El Numero Uno, uh, uh, that Ginky Horiguchi, twenty one years later, that's what he's still basing himself off of. I think it's something that, in a lot of ways. Naruki Doi's career started on March 13th, 2005. You're exactly right. You know, the next 20 years of Doi's career are by and large defined by what he did on this show or in the moments where he was babyface trying to rectify things he did on this show. Yep, that is true. I don't know if he ever got good with Daniel Mishima, though. I, I, I would not forgive him if I was Daniel Mishima. No, no, I would not. So that gives us a finals matchup. It is Yoshino, all caps, Versus Naruki Doi. We do have a semifinal. And it's kind of fit set up in a perfect way with how everything has been happening at ringside throughout this. That the semi-main, the semi-main event of this show was a six-man 
tag team match it would well, be real, real quick real quick because i know you didn't watch it there's akatoshi saito versus stalker chikawa yeah it is a lower end stalker match you you are okay skipping this one i stepped it because it was saito but yeah I it's, a... it's fine i mean it, look there's there's a few worse stalker matches out there but this is also kind of golden era stalker and uh saito uh, it's not that he doesn't play ball but also people were better at playing ball than he was yeah, it's only four minutes. Uh, at the Koshi, Saito wins with the sickle death. You're better off watching that Takayama match during the intermission. You're exactly right, because that is peak stalker. Yeah, absolutely. So the summer main event is uh, building throughout the show. Blood Generation versus the proto Pause Heart. I, I thought that Pause Hearts came together like a week later or so, but Anthony W. Mori at this time, still a member of Italian Connection, Teaming up with Magnum Tokyo and BB Hulk. Magnum Tokyo listed as do fixers of uh, uh, Magnum Tokyo, which kind of confused me with that timeline of Pause Hearts as well. But it's Shima, Don Fuji, and Shingo Takagi versus Magnum Hulk and Mori. It's Shingo winning with the last falconry. Uh, Ishikawa, the announcer, is going nuts for the last falconry in 16 minutes and 30 seconds. And Kiss. I have a four and a quarter star match for BB Hulk in his second week of professional wrestling. This is why I wanted to do a, a rewind and rewatch for this show, because oddly enough, it was about four years ago when COVID first hit. I went through all of the Dragon Gate footage from 2005 that was out there. And this match jumped out to me. And I was like, what in the world is this? Why does nobody talk about this match? This is the very first ever BB Hulk versus Shingo Takagi match. Hulk is a week into his career and he looks unbelievable. This is why. Forget how good Doi was. Forget Shisa. Forget Yoshino. This is the match I want to talk about because it is a true hidden gem from 2005 Dragon Gate. Yeah, it's something where you have uh, Don Fuji, who is still incredibly taken seriously at this point, and he is putting BB Hulk through the paces in a very scary fashion. Hulk is really fun. It, like, I forget how much fun pre-World 1 Hulk is just because he is so skinny and he is doing like all of these flips. He's so raw in a way, and Magnum is uh mr ecotus what a guy and yeah, this is a good magnum night this is a very good magnum, magnum night i would say yeah I, magnum and shingo not bad chemistry those two had no no you're 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 exactly right i mean this is I, really this is sort of the snapshot of of 2005 dragon gate uh, minus rio saito because you've got shingo in there and shingo's on the rise all year you've got hulk in there the second dojo student which is really important to note Shima, Shima, Fuji's Fuji. And this is, you know, throughout the entire year, look, I've watched all this stuff. Magnum's not great in a lot of it, but Magnum is really great in this match. Yeah, and like more importantly, so Pause Hearts gets Anthony W. Mori into it. And you're you're able to basically you have the working trio of Shisa, uh, Hulk, and Mori for the next two years. And Whenever uh, Magnum was healthy and when he was up for it, you got to have some of that into it. But it's sometimes it was such a detractment. It was such a weird thing with Magnum in 2005, 2006. In a lot of ways, Magnum is very important for what would happen in 2003 to lead into 2004 for the split to happen. But he is someone that I know we've talked about a lot. He's a little out of time at this point. And very this, much so. But this is a match where he really turns it back. And you mentioned the first dojo student, Shingo Takagi, class of 2004. You mentioned the second dojo student, BB um, Hulk, class of 2005. The third dojo student, Akira Tozawa, beat up by uh, beat up by Don Fuji in the start of this match. Really plays off in the post match here because he would do his debut. I think it is. Uh, this show he has his debut coming up at the end of the next tour yeah it's, it's april 3rd so right in kobe sambo hall i was just trying to i knew it was in kobe i just didn't know if it was on the brave gate tour or on the next one yeah so uh, this is kind of the deal throughout 2005 is 
Fuji is just beating up Tozawa, who's a young boy who's just at ringside, and Tozawa keeps on trying to get one over on him, and Fuji beats him up before the match, and then Tozawa finally lands some offense uh, as Blood Generation is leaving the ring here. So you see Hulk and Shingo shine. I mean, young Hulk, it you know, it's like you can't you can't get mad at the guy for still wrestling. His career, by and large, is over in 2019. I think that's the last serious injury that he had. And even then, it's like, you really look at the, you know, it's 2005 to 2014. That is like prime BB Hulk. And then 2014 to 2019, he's making it work. And now he's in this era where he's largely inoffensive. But if you only know old BB Hulk... I mean, he's just, he's remarkable here. He's remarkable in 2008 and 9 and 10. I, I, I love World 1 era BB Hulk, but he really hits the ground running in a way where I don't know if he gets the credit for it that he deserves. Yeah, and it's something where he really shows his influences early on in a fun way. Like, you you really see the Hayabusa in him at this point, Yeah, yeah, right? it's, it's, he's what happens if you take Hayabusa and Magnum Tokyo and make a wrestler. Right, and it's so much fun. And you have Shima, who 2005, like we do, we have not talked about Shima in 2005. He is just already a man possessed. Like he's he's he is, a psycho. He, he's I mean, he he's three months away from going to Buffalo and everything changing. Yeah, he's just he's out of his fucking mind in the best way possible. You know who Magnum, 2005 Magnum. Do you know who he's like in modern wrestling? Ah. Uh, Okay, uh, I I feel like who 2005 Magnum is for me t- this year is different for who it is for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably fair. 2005 Magnum is a lot like Chris Jericho, where okay. I think, you know, l- let's be honest, Magnum's peak is basically 1999, and then 2000, 2001, 2003, like... He's kind of adapting on the fly and he's figuring out how to hang with people that are more talented than him, which I think is what we've seen for basically Jericho's entire AEW run. And I think it's right now where there's a crossroads moment. And for Magnum, he never got it back for Jericho. Time will tell. But now it's finally like, oh, he's the old guy and he's not like Shima. He's not like Mochi. He's not like Fuji he hasn't figured out what this chapter of his career is and he never really does. Yeah. And it's really something that I think it's not just the talent. I think you, when you introduce someone like BB Hulk and you kind of portray him as this air that it's very much so that at this time and the way that they make sure that it, this big feud is about blood generation and pause hearts. It is Shima and Shima's net new guy against Magnum Tokyo and Magnum's new guy. And the problem is, is that Magnum's new guy is not just like shiny and new. He's able to do things completely different and Magnum's not able to do those anymore. Yes. That's uh, a, that's a very good read of it. Yeah. So I really enjoyed Magnum in this. He reminds me of, you know, who one of my favorite wrestlers is today. The one that whenever I see him show up on the show, I'm like, all right, this is not going to be a no. I put down the pencil, actually, and I just enjoy it just for what it is. And part of it is just because his just general presence cracks me up. Who's that? Kaz Hayashi. I OK, I can see that. Yeah, like it, like this is what I imagine. Like Kaz Hayashi's retirement run right now in Glade is what I imagine what uh, Magnum Tokyo would be doing if he was wrestling today. Other than that, would require him and Shima to get along in a professional setting. And I don't think we can count on that. No, 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 no. And that's not a dig at Shima. That's not. <laughs> that's not. To be clear, that's not a dig on Shima. That's a that's a statement on Magnum Tokyo. Someone who I still try to find things out about him modern day just because i just wonder what's up like that is the the, the thing case if, if somehow like i powerball is crazy right now i'm going to do a finding magnum tokyo thing if i want powerball i'm I all for know, it I, we, I, we found sua we might as well find magnum 
Yeah, we found Sue, and Sue is an absolute delight. I, I, he's really, really nice. Yeah, he, he is someone that whenever I, I see him show up on social media, I never have any questions about him, unlike someone who was in this uh, tournament here about whenever he tweets something. <laughs> that could be a few different guys. <laughs> but you know which one that is uh, particular. Uh, any other big thoughts on this? I was four and a quarter stars on this. This is, yeah, I, I think, I, the best I, match I on the too. show. It, it, it's... Uh, it, yeah, I probably like it just a hair more than the main event, but I have I have both the main event and the semi main event at four and a quarter. But mm-hmm. you know, look, it's it's a historical match. It's the first time Hulk and Shingo wrestled each other, and it's just it's it's awesome. And it's very it's very strange to me that Dragon Gate two thousand five circulates pretty well. You know, Ditch had a lot of it. Uh, you know, there's the the one fourteen oh five show that I think is out there pretty well. It's Blood Generation and Do Fixer, so there's there's uh, names on the marquee that people know. But this was on a pay per view, and it aired in full. And I I don't feel like anybody ever talks about this match. And and just one more time, just to read off the names here, it's Shima Fuji and Shingo versus Mori Hulk and Magnum, and uh, it's it's unbelievable. It is really well worth your time. If you ever want to see Anthony W. Mori do suplexes that kind of hurt the realm of uh, believability, it is this match. He throws around Shingo. He throws like, around Shingo. He also, Mori has such good chemistry with Shima in this match. Yeah, like that's, I wonder if there's any kind of way we're able to get Mori back for a match this year. I'm ready for it. I know he said he was only going to do a one-time reunion or one-time return for the 20th anniversary, but I kind of want to see, like, Mori versus UT would be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, there's, um, I'm looking at it now. It looks like Shima and Mori, they wrestled a singles match, El Numero Uno 2004, that made TV. I'm going to try to find that because I'd like to see that. M- Mori, I mean... Look, Mori was retired by the time that I got into Dragon Gate. So oh, yeah. I don't I don't have like warm, fuzzy memories of Mori, but he is a guy who when I go back and I watch some of this stuff, it's like, oh yeah, he did a lot of things that I liked. And when he was in a serious role, he more often than not delivered. Yeah, I mean, it is also the thing you deal with Mori that so for those who will experience watching this, uh Mori comes out to Britney Spears. <laughs> and he is like, it, it's one of those things that it's, it's a little discordant with this guy. And it's one of those things also considering how much older Maury was than a lot of people on the roster. I wonder if this was one of those Shima ribs in a way. Oh, but, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's kind of discordant. Also, uh, because he's not on the show, but he does something really awesome here. Michael Awasa is a part of the post-match with Tozawa, where Awasa like just kind of saves the day. And he rocks the whole thing. If you start it from Fuji beating up Tozawa through the end with Tozawa and Awasa, it's just an awesome segment of pro wrestling. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the, the first rookie that uh, Fuji went after was Awasa when he was Takamichi Wasa, the little devil guy. And that is uh, much in the in the same way that uh, this night defined Naruki Doi's career. That is what ended up defining Don Fuji's career. Absolutely. But then we get to the main event. It is for the uh, uh, inaugural Open the Brave Gate Championship. Naruki Doi versus Yoshino. It is Naruki Doi winning with two Bakatare sliding kicks after an avalanche Doi fives. Naruki Doi becomes the first Open the Brave Gate Championship. He completes the uh, the belt uh, front plate, and the crowd is just livid at him the entire time after a classic where we kind of get to see the t2p positioning kind of play out here and naruki doi over overcoming the second doi trappings finally for good on this night i think this is on the higher end of the doi yoshino singles matches and the big thing for me is that i was so surprised by the physicality of this match and it's kind of a constant in all of the doi matches you know the shisa match there's there's the dq uh initially with blood generation and then on the comeback doi really manhandles shisa and then you have the awasa match uh i'm sorry the mishima match where doi obviously you know pummels him with a steel chair and then you have this match where doi 
everything he does seems to have an extra snap and an extra pop to it. And Yoshino is the perfect guy to play off of that because he can sell so beautifully. But then a Masato Yoshino comeback is one of the most beautiful things in wrestling history. And it is just, it is remarkable the things that these guys do to each other. And they go for quite a long time. I mean, this is not a short main event by any means. I, I think it, uh, 21 minutes. Yeah, 21 minutes. And it, it does not drag, though. You know, they they had singles matches throughout the years that were more in the three and a half, three and three quarter star range. And this is one that I just can't imagine anybody going under four on. And your mileage may vary on whether it's four, four and a quarter, four and a half. But man, this is some of their best work together ever. Yeah. And it's this moment that has to happen here where Yosino, who is Mr. Uh, NWA welterweight him and Kness are the ones that say we need to have a belt like this they're the ones who kind of start this but he needs to be the one to pass the baton off to Naruki Doi Naruki Doi becomes uh, Mr. Bravegate in the for few years afterwards it does end up happening that the true Mr. Bravegate is Mr. NWA world welterweight it is Masato Yoshino he does have six open the Bravegate title belts but you need to have Naruki Doi, at least at this moment, where Doi never got a win over Yoshino up to this point. Throughout T2P, it was very, very clear. It, it was Magnum Tokyo up top. It was Yoshino along with brother Stevie Sujimoto at two. And then so far off that he was not even on the list with second Doi. And, and the, thing, the, the, the thing to note here, like I said, when we started talking about this show specifically is think about how dominant Yoshino had been in singles matches too. Oh, absolutely. Like well, the losses he had were with, okay, Shima did not win against Shima at this point, but Shima was the guy outside. You, If he had wins against uh, Shima, I would be kind of surprised because he did, I believe, get a fall on Magnum at one point. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, I mean, his losses are to Shima and to Toro Washi in 2004 Torimon, which to kind of come full circle, eh, Aganisu was beating everybody in 2004 Torimon. So, you know, right. the, the two losses to Shima, 2003 and 2004, then a Washi, and then a pair of time limit draws. But, you know, uh, Yoshino was as protected, if not more, than anybody on the roster. And Doi just comes in and, you know, he has to put up a fight. But in the end, the, the double Bakatari sliding kick finish is so interesting because I love the Avalanche Doi 5. What an awful move to, for Doi to take, by the way. Just It has to be so painful, that landing. And then Yoshino kicks out a one sliding kick. Doi gives him a second. That's the end of it. It is emphatic, and it is, it, it is a little like uh, when Shingo beat Mochi in 2015, where it's just like, oh, oh, okay, they're really doing this. Got it. Right, yeah, this was very much like he, he could have put his foot on his chest and just like stayed there with it afterwards. But you needed to have that. You need to have an emphatic because if you looked at where blood generation was and how its formation was, and we'll talk more about this in 10 months, but they needed to have the rising star because Shingo and eight months would be shipped off to Ring of Honor. Like he, like it was time to get someone up there with Shima, uh, Don Fuji at this point was still a number two, but it was something where Don Fuji would have his one Dreamgate run, but his relevance, th this is Don Fuji kind of at his apex or approaching his apex here. You needed to have the time to bring up another strong heel, and that is something that the company would do time and time again throughout the time is having the rising heel star and the first one in the Dragon Gate era had to be Naruki Doi, and they set it up perfectly. I, I could have said it better myself. This is a very special show, uh, one that I think is really worth watching if you're interested in the history of Dragon Geek because it, it really tells the story of Doi. It tells the story of Shingo and Hulk, and there's a bunch of great matches on this show. I mean, it's really, it's a very long show because you have the eight tournament matches, or I'm sorry, the, the seven tournament matches, and then two you know lengthy six mans to go along with it but I, they're everything outside of maybe the stalker match is really worth your time you know this is just a top to bottom this is like uh you know gabe used to always say he's like it it doesn't make me a great booker because i book danielson versus nigel like anybody can do that this is a show with great 
booking. Stuff happens and stuff matters on this show, top to bottom. It is so engaging from start to finish. It, it is really a, a, an underrated historically Dragon Gate show. And it's something like you talk about, like start to finish and like standalone thing. Think about this in the context of Dragon Gate. They still have not turned one full year old without Ultimo. And it's 2005 when this happened, Case. Imagine going to your local indie show and you hear throughout the times and you maybe saw like on message boards or maybe you read the observer at the time and you hear about okay dragon gate did this show for their lightweight belt and you see this dvd on like mayfield's desk or it, or some other tape trader there this is a hell of a dvd purchase like i'm imagining myself 2005 going to a wrestling show of seeing this here this would have been a great $20 purchase at that point, if you think about it that way. Like, it's just a very complete show. Like, you, I kind of, in a, in a similar way, imagine, like, renting this thing from Blockbuster. This would have been such a fun kind of complete show to, like, watch over a weekend or be like, hey, got a wrestling show, and this is the one I was going to watch for is. I kind of love this, and I miss that Dragon Gate used to have these kind of things. Like, it doesn't make business sense anymore for them to have these things, and pay-per-view is pretty much dead within japan at least this kind of way but it's a real kind of remarkable testament of the time i couldn't agree more so uh you know look i, I will have the link to this show in the episode description it'll be on voices wrestling.com i'll probably just link it in the voices of wrestling discord and the open the voice gate channel too because i think it's a show that more people need to see and uh i i, I look forward to another rewind and rewatch very shortly here mike Yep, I can't wait for April and what that brings for us here. But that's going to do it for us this week on Open the Voice Gate. Next week, we'll be back with more of a standard Voice Gate uh, show talking about Dragon Gate uh, week three of Ray Day Parejas and that Booyah Den show coming up this week. But that's going to do it for us here. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Case is at underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next time. Take care, everyone. Hola, hola. My name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish-speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and, of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí.